from Aqueduct Racetrack in South Ozone Park, New York. Happy New Year. And to the horses, happy birthday. You see, that's how it works in thoroughbred racing. January 1st is a universal birthday for every registered North American thoroughbred. In other words, yesterday's two-year-olds are now three, and in just over four months, the 149th running of the Kentucky Derby just for three-year-olds. Today at Oaklawn Park, a Kentucky Derby qualifying race, the Smarty Jones. How good is victory formation? Six to five, morning line favorite. Should he win? 10 Derby qualifying points are all his. Great to have you with us on America's Day at the Races. Brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit America's Best Racing. .net today. Look at that long line to get Andy Serling's autograph here on New Year's Day. And at Aqueduct, looks a little different than it did yesterday. Sun's out, clear skies, picture perfect conditions for thoroughbred racing alongside New York Racing Association analyst Andy Serling. I'm Lafitte Pinkai. Happy New Year, my friend. You too. It's nice for you. Well, that was going on. I'd already been here for a couple hours. You, I think, just strolled in a few minutes ago. About nice to be seven Lafitte minutes Pinkai. ago. I tell you what, it's kind of nice. This really... already has to be like one of your greatest New Year's days ever. We spent it we with you. It really is three and a half incredible. hours together. Yeah, no, it is. I'm trying to think what my second best New Year's is, and it's hard to know. It really is. But looking forward to last it. Last year. We did it last year. Did we do it last year. We did. So. So I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking two losers probably did nothing <laughs> on New Year's Eve together. Separately, but together, we both did nothing. Um, Jonathan called me at like 1230 last night. It was a miracle he found me up. He Jonathan probably tried last night? He did. It was very nice of him, yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Just yeah. happy New Year? Yeah, it was very nice. Yeah, I appreciated it. He's going to be on the show. I know he is. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Big show. Paula Duca, Gary Stevens on site, Oaklawn Park, and this is a big reason why that aforementioned Smarty Jones, which is the America's Best Racing's Race of the Week, and the first step towards the Arkansas Derby at Oaklawn Park. Three-year-olds running a mile, quarter-million-dollar purse, 20 derby points available, 10 to the winner, number eight, victory formation. Undefeated favorite, six to five on the morning line, and this is part of the reason why Andy Victory Formation's second career start, Churchill Downs, when he's down along the inside, and it looks like he's in deep, deep water. It does, and he comes back and wins. But I do think it's important to note that the horse that he beat came back and lost as the heavy favorite in the stake race yesterday, yesterday. going six furlongs. So I do think that is an important thing to mention. And he's got to stretch out. Now he's a son of Tappert. And you see him winning at six and a half and six. And you think, why wouldn't a son of Tappert be better going longer? Tappert, of course, won our Belmont Stakes a few years ago. And that's not an unreasonable conclusion. But pedigrees aren't always the only answer. And I was looking up some stats for Brad Cox. He has strong numbers stretching out on the dirt. He's 16 for 61 over the last five years, and this 26% win average. But the ROI is $1.19. And at 26%, you're not going to make money with victory no. formation because it sort of fits in a line there, right? There are a bunch of six and seven to five shots that are winning 26% of the time, which is great if you're a trainer. Not so great if you're betting him at six to five. Yeah, and Brad Cox says he's very excited to see him go a little bit longer, not concerned whatsoever about the Outside post, that's victory formation, six to five, morning line favor for the Smarty Jones as we welcome in Paula Duca, Gary Stevens on site, Oaklawn Park. Gentlemen, a very happy new year to both of you. And imagine there's a lot of excitement surrounding these newly turned three year olds at Oaklawn in this first step towards the Arkansas Derby and maybe the Kentucky Derby. Well, obviously, yeah, it starts today, doesn't it, Gary? It, it really does. And yes, joined by Hall of Famer Gary Stevens here, two time winner that he says he can remember of the Smarty Jones. But yeah, familiar with this racetrack, Gary. You know what this means. This is the start of the Derby Chase. Let's go. Yeah, here we go. The March starts today. And uh, listen, I, I think this is a wide open race. Uh, Dennington, horse that had some trouble in the Kentucky Jockey Club at Churchill Downs last time out. I loved what I saw from him going back and watching the race. Shuffled back around the far turn. Look, and Brad Cox, he's got two. That's a McPeak, Dennington. He won four races yesterday. He's yeah. on a roll. Yeah, McPeak got two in the race, and obviously victory formation, your morning line favorite. Brad Cox has another one in there as well. That's going to get some consideration. Yeah, don't throw him out. Joe Talamo is here for the winter time. He's riding the other Angel of yeah. Empire, the seven horse in there. You get 15 to one, or you get six to five with Flavian Pratt, so be wary. Yeah, listen, Lafitte, it, it's an absolutely gorgeous day considering... You know, the beginning of this meet, we had frozen temperatures. The most beautiful day of the meet, about 68 degrees and sunny. We cannot wait for the Smarty Jones. The Smarty Jones, excuse me, the late pick five, a uh, nine race card today. We'll start in race five. Gary and I will have you covered. Great stuff, guys. Exciting day of racing at Oaklawn Park and this path from Hot Springs to Louisville. 
Today's Smarty Jones, uh, the Southwest late January, the Rebel in March. Uh, finally, the biggest race at Oaklawn, Grade 1 Arkansas Derby. Lots of money, lots of derby points offered at Oaklawn Park. All gets started later this afternoon. Today's schedule brought to you by Claiborne Farm. No fog, no problem at Aqueduct. Late pick four gets started in moments. Race six, horses are in the paddock. And at Oaklawn, uh, the six remaining races. Smarty Jones is the eighth post time around 5-10 Eastern. As fun as it is to uh, watch this terrific thoroughbred racing, that much more exciting to watch and wager. Join today, NairaBets.com, and when you do so, uh, use that promo code and the $200 deposit match. Sign up today, match 200. Join us at NairaBets.com, any track, anywhere. Let's get to the live racing, Andy. Updated odds race six, just a $20,000 maiden claimer. Phillies and mares at three quarter of a mile dash. Scratch number seven, Madam Rose. Number two, mostly harmless, the two to one favorite. Eight minutes out. Yeah, this is sort of the Kentucky Derby of horses who have had 80 million chances to break their maidens in <laughs> bottle level claiming races. And it's one of those races where when you look at the first horse, the two mostly harmless has the rail, you go, well, I know you're betting against mostly harmless. I mean, she's due for 18 lifetime. Now, 10 of them are in the turf, dirt. So two for two, oh, for 10 uh, a lifetime, two seconds and four thirds. But then you start looking through the field and you realize that at least based on her last race, she's the horse to beat. And you've got horses like Afalada, the four, who's 0 for 11 on the dirt and is probably the second likeliest winner. I mean, a horse like Gracefully Wild, who has trouble running a 30 buyer, is the third choice, second choice at four to one right now. I picked Rissell, the number six, lower profile connections, okay. going to keep the price a bit higher. Her last race is probably the fastest race in the dirt anybody's ever run from a buyer speed figure scale. And it's her last race, and she's only over four in the dirt. So yeah. she hasn't compiled that enormously Can't bad record on the fault dirt. her for what she has not done. Right. We're not getting that 37 to one today that no. she was in her most recent effort. Somebody has to win. Somebody is Somebody going has to, to win. At least one horse will leave this race, <laughs> not a maiden. Could be three or four. They all hit the wire together. Hashtag analysis. Somebody has to win. The uh, sixth race started the late pick four. That's next. Just getting started on America's Day at the Races from Aqueduct on Fox Sports 2. A grade one winner of nearly $2 million, Silver State hails from the sire line of legendary Claiborne Stallion Danzig. And his second dam is full sister to Kentucky Derby winner Monarcos. After winning the Oaklawn Handicap, Silver State defeated Nick's Go in the grade one Metropolitan Handicap. On the board in 12 of 14 starts from ages two to four, his career included a six race winning streak. Grade one winner Silver State standing at Claiborne Farm. Three, two. A gorgeous afternoon 
Very warm in South Ozone Park here on this New Year's Day. Coverage as always brought to you by Claiborne Farm. 100 years doing the usual unusually well. Riders up for this sixth race. Started a late pick four. And while you're looking at mostly harmless, let's uh, revisit her most recent effort. Early December right here. And yeah, look, she runs well, Andy, as you mentioned, just second best, but far ahead of the rest. Yeah, there, there's nothing. I'm not going to knock this horse. I think she's probably the right price around two to one. She's the worst to beat on. I'm not going to pick her. I'm not taking an 0 for 18, even though it's only 0 for 10 in the dirt. But she is the horse to beat. And you'll see a lot, especially as you get to the winter time period. Horses like mostly harmless horses that have earned money, that have had their chances. Usually they win by attrition at some point mm -hmm. over the winter because they just find a field that they just can't help but beat by showing up. If she runs that race, should that be good enough to beat? this crew? Probably. It depends about the six. I mean, the six is sort of an unknown because it's hard to know exactly where that last race came from, and it mm -hmm. was a mile, and now you cut back to six furlongs. I think the race by the six last time is the competitive race, and that's why I picked her. I thought 0 for 4, un, you know, sort of pro, low profile connections, wouldn't take as much money, and I'd ra I'm not going to, I'm going to pick somebody a little better price. Okay. That was my thinking. We'll see you in the post parade. The entry, Cairosa. Fulini, two for one, you're getting five to one? Yeah, well, this is this sort of is, says it all for entries, right? This entry is five to mm -hmm. one. Kairosa's run two buyers, 17 and 19. Off a little bit of a layoff, but Source has done zero running. Gracefully Wild completes Exactus, second and four of nine. I know, but the recent form is just so slow, and there's nothing to indicate recently that this horse is competitive anymore. Afalada at three to one. Yeah, I mean, I guess she's got some races that are at least at that worst fringe. Lord, hear my prayer. It's been a struggle. Andy's top selection, Russell. Yeah, I think Lord, hear my prayer. That's probably the right word, if you, the right comment, if you bet the worst. As far as Russell, hasn't had enough chances on the dirt. Five to one, nine to two, bet a few dollars. Boxed in and bored. It's chapter seven of my autobiography. Time spent with Andy Serling. Yeah, this is the way I feel many days <laughs> sitting here with you. I, I admit, I'm not really boxed in. I can get out. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I've got Travis here to protect me in case you get really out of line. He's got more loyalty to me than you. You're rarely Richie, here. Richie Migliori knows something about boxing them in, right? Joining us now, watching these horses warm up. Richie, welcome to the show. Happy New Year. What are you noticing in these maiden claimers as we get closer to post time? Yeah, Happy New Year to you as well, Lafitte, and, and, and the guy sitting next to you, I guess. But uh, uh, I want to talk about equipment first, and we'll, we'll talk about the entry, Cairosa and Fulini. Um, they both have earmuffs uh, for uh, the James Bond barn, and that's usually just to mute some sound. Horses tend to be a little bit more nervous or high strung. They react to noise, so it just kind of thwarts the sound a little bit. Uh, of the two, the 1A Fulini uh, makes a, a nicer impression, just a bit of a stouter filly uh, overall. It looks to me a, a little bit better. The uh, guess. Sorry, guys, I lost my place here. The five, Lord, hear my prayer, is outfitted with a breastplate. That's for horses with higher and narrow withers. Keep the saddle from slipping back. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that equipment a little bit. But the two horses that stood out from a physical perspective to me were Andy Selection, the six, Russell. Um, and honestly, from a physical perspective, she certainly looks like the turnback will suit her. She she ran well going a mile last time, but she's a bit of more compact filly, good energy level to her, like what I saw from her. Um, I, I think she's a nice alternative to your favorite. And the horse I landed on is the four, Afalada. She is 0 for 11, but she was the one to me that stood out in the paddock. I, I thought she just, from a, her coat, her, the weight she was carrying, and I liked the way she warmed up. I really think the four and the six of the two I want to lean on, but I landed on the four here, guys, even though she is 0 for 11. Afalada at 7 to 2, the MIG's top selection, and yeah, the, the consistency, which is, which is uh, again, it, that goes a long way, where a little will go a long way in these types of races, and the fact she's been in the money in 7 of 11. I, I have a, a, a sort of a saying that, that sounds like it's mean, but I don't mean it that way, but it's effective as bad horses win bad races. And I think when you get into a race where the field hasn't shown a lot in their races, you can have an open mind and you can try to be creative in these races because the margin sometimes between horses that don't look that good, if you can find a reason, and listen, I'm not saying I have something yeah. particularly creative in here. I picked a horse's nine to two is like the third choice right now. But I'm saying sometimes in these races, you can find a reason because especially you can find reasons against shorter priced horses. And in this particular case, I'm not going to knock anybody for taking somebody here, though I think the entry at five to one is horrible value. Jonathan Kitchen is with us, JK. Like, that sounds like something that could be marketed or branded. Like, you need to contact your old smoke people, get a t shirt. Like, bad horses win bad races. 
Yeah, that would probably do all right. We could put Andy's like little face in the bottom corner. I think it would do Wait, all right. I want to know something. Um, Jonathan's shirt and my, my jacket actually look very similar. I mean, you're a little louder than me. They are. You got a little, really. That might work together. Yeah. It's, if you wear this jacket with cold. that shirt, it's going to be a problem. That was the closest you'll ever get to a compliment on your wardrobe from Andy, JK. This is a new suit, so I'm not going to insult it that badly. <laughs> Uh, yesterday, he said, he said I, look, I have on pajamas all the time. So uh, this is a little pajama-ish, too, I suppose. But, um, I, look, I agree with Andy in this spot. I, it feels like the two is the most likely winner, right? I mean, uh, mostly harmless. But like Andy said, this isn't a great race. And so when you have a short-priced horse in a race that's not great horses in it, Sometimes I get a little nervous taking a short price horse because I don't necessarily trust that one at a short price. Most likely winner. I'm going to pick the six as well. Uh, and this is a horse that spent a lot of time on the turf and, and didn't really do much running. But somehow, some way, last time, sort of figured it out a little bit. Ran one of the best looking races, maybe not from a speed figure standpoint. But, and, and then in that race, faced a little bit of adversity too. At the beginning of the race, kind of got shuffled back, lost a little position, then came rallying and, and, and still kind of ran well. So I think at the price, I'm going to go with the six for sell. Um, but I do think the two is the most likely winner. But I agree with that statement. You know, I think a lot of times you look that Andy made about bad horses win bad races. I think what he's trying to say is when you look at a field and, and you start to be like, ooh, these horses just don't want to win not very fast not very this well none of them really want to win none of them are very fast so you have to kind of take a step back and just pick the one that you think can win versus this group so congratulations to whoever gets their picture taken after this one it's appropriate it's not a critique it's it's appropriate and the other thing about horses of lower quality is they're not as consistent so you sometimes you see a horse who looks like the horse to beat and maybe it's not a maiden race maybe it's a lower level claim race and you think well, these horses are consistent. They're, one of the reasons you like higher level horses, they're more reliable mm -hmm. to show up. And so I think it's, it's okay to keep an open mind. See how it all unfolds. Graduation day for one of them. Chris Griffin standing by with the call. It's post time and start of the late pick four from the Big A on New Year's Day. All set. And they're off. Mostly Harmless has early speed, so does Fellini. Entered the far outside, boxed in and bored is in the early fray as well. In between horses comes Gracefully Wild, as dropping back a touch was Kaya Rosa, is now back in fifth. Getting passed on the outside by Rissell, who's making a mid-race move. Here comes Rissell, is now within two of the leaders. Towards the back end of the field there, Afalata and Lord. Hear my prayer is the trailer. Less than four furlongs to travel. It's a scramble on for the lead and backing out of there is going to be gracefully wild. Just got squeezed. The leader is Fellini. It's Fellini in front. Mostly harmless is tightly at the rail here in the red cap. Boxed in and board is three wide. Taking a little off the pace there was gracefully wild who is trying to re-engage now from the fourth position. It's a wide run for Rissell. 22.89 for that opening quarter mile. They approach a quarter mile left to go and Fellini is trying to dispatch a mostly harmless who's still right there at the rail as they reach the top of the stretch. Losing some ground there was boxed in and bored. Rissell has got momentum. Yellow cap down the center of the racetrack. Fellini is trying to put this one away. Mostly harmless, but Rissell is getting closer for a final furlong. Here comes Rissell up on the outside of Fellini. Fellini is not in front as Rissell has passed on by. Inside the final 16th, Rissell is now up by a length and a half. Rissell will get the score. It's Rissell over Fellini. Late run here from Afalata from far out of it to grab third. Then came Kaya Rosa, and uh, further back was mostly harmless in one minute 13.7, four seconds. In her 12th career start, Rissell, Andy's top selection, JK's as well, closing at 5-1 to one to kick off the late pick four at Aqueduct. Two blind squirrels in the same day finding an acorn. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, they, they pay at the window whether they're winning the Woodward, you know, Doesn't the matter. Breeders' Cup race, Doesn't the matter. Derby, or a $20,000 maiden claiming race on New Year's Day. And I think one of the keys with Rissell was what John and I were talking about was even though she was 0 for 11, she was just 0 for 4 on the dirt, whereas the other horses taking money were 0 for 10, 0 for 11 on the dirt. And I think sometimes you have to separate a horse's, um, a horse's record by surfaces they've been on. And plus you had Rissell, who the best race she'd ever run was her last race. And she was 5 to 1. Yeah. If she was 5 to 2, neither Jonathan and I would have, would, have, would have bet on her in this race. But at 5 to 1 in this field, based on her last race, she made some sense. In uh, this case, it worked out. Frequently, it won't. I'm not insinuating there was a foul, but the favorite, mostly harmless, like got shaved in the stretch yeah. twice. Once by Fellini, once by the eventual winner, Roussel. Uh, she just came up short this afternoon. The uh, What was she at post time? 
She was like six to five or even, even money, money at post time. Yeah, and, and finishing I mean, off the board. The, the lesson here is, don't bet horses like mostly har harmless at even money. Just find an alternative. You know, I'm not saying she's not going to win, but she's got her record for a reason. Which is why I asked if she runs back to that last race, does she win? And we discussed the lack of consistency when it comes to the lower right. level. So you get the, can you count on her to reproduce that? Uh, apparently not. And you throw in a wet track. And the thing about wet tracks is they're not going to play favorites. Maybe most horses will handle it, but it's just as likely that a horse at a short price, especially at this level, is not going to be thrilled with the going as a horse who's 25 to 1. You and JK come out guns blazing. 5 to 1, Russell. 6 1, 4 1, Aqueduct. Post parade, Oaklawn for the fourth. And we start with a real jewel, idle since late August. Quick mare, though. And she was sharp. She does feel like the speed, but it feels like the current favorite, Prince, Prince Dream, Dreamsis. I'm sorry I pronounced that. Could be a thorn in her side. Uh, Lady Astrid, unraced since late April. Tough to make a case for this Arkansas bread in here. Number three, Italian Justice, nine-time winner, but 0 for 6 last year. I thought she made a lot of sense in this race dropping down, though, and I thought she fit and think she's an outrageous price. I'm going to bet on her. Princess Dream Cess, as you mentioned, the favorite. Christian Torres looking for a second win this afternoon. If she can get away from Princess Dream Cess, she's going to be tough in here. A girl like me, second choice, three to one. Rafael Bejarano takes over for Tom Amos. Tom Amos, not great at, at uh, the Oakland. The last five years, just 13% with 183 stars, the dollar one ROI. By his standards, that is a low percentage. That's, that's not right, standards. Tom, yeah. and the dollar for every dollar is bet. Super Wonder Girl, uh, what happened to her tactical speed? We it, haven't seen it. It feels like she no longer has that speed, and it's going along with her no longer being that good. Right. Chasing Shadows pictured uh, first half to the claim, Marty Biafranco. Yeah, he, you know what's amazing? He's only 0 for 1 off the claim at dirt at Oaklawn. Isn't that odd? Wow. I guess he probably hasn't run that many, obviously. Mohe Lady. Uh, owned by the Lucases, Lori and Wayne. Wayne does the training. This horse looks so bad on paper that maybe she's live because Wayne, sometimes <laughs> the worse they look, the liver they are, but she does not look good on paper. And that's the field for this $30,000 claimer. Six furlongs, fillies and mares, four-year-olds and older. Right back to Paula Duca at Oaklawn Park. Let's start with uh, Princess Dreamsess, Polly, who is the nine to five choice. What are you expecting from her today? Yeah, you know, I, I think she is the filly to catch in here. But, you know, Andy makes a good point. The rail filly in here, Real Jewel, is very, very fast. So what's going to give early in this race? I mean, I think the five will be ultra tough if she's able to clear in here. Um, but, you know, the one is fast, too. So, you know, the first quarter of a mile of this race will probably set up what's going to happen after. So I, I can understand why the public at nine to five is going towards the five. Now the six, the Tom Amos runner. Looks like the horse that can maybe, you know, sit a little bit. If you look back at her PPs earlier in the year, she was sitting really, really far back. And even in her last race in a six-horse field, she broke dead last. Um, she's had gait issues. And, you know, I don't know if she's going to be able, if she can't get out of the gate and stay intact be between the one and five, um, unless they get in a wicked speed duel, then she can maybe run them down. I was actually interested in the seven, another horse that has gait issues. But if you look back, way back when, the horse really didn't. And I'm wondering now the drop. And, you know, what's interesting to me when I look look at the running lines of the seven, you know, Robertino Diodoro claimed this horse for 32000 He stuck this horse in really tough spots, allowance races. This horse got bet down to even money and favorite in both of those starts. So obviously was training unbelievable, but the gait is her issue. So I'm going to take a little bit of a shot with a seven from off the pace here at seven to one, and maybe she can get out of the gate. But I think the race will be won in, in the first quarter of a mile or loss, guys, between the one and the five. I think if the five gets loose, she's going to be tough to beat. The one gets underneath her, I'll go with the seven from off the pace. At seven to one, super wonder girl. Uh, we'll know early on, Andy, because she needs to reach back and find that tactical speed that she somewhat used to her advantage going back to last summer that we haven't seen in a handful of starts. And, I mean, you can talk, obviously, Gary and Richie can talk about this much more than, than we can, but it's, it's also a fairly obvious concept. When you have a speed and you draw the rail, 
You just don't yeah. have options. You have to go. And when you've got to speed outside, and it does seem like Nick Juarez, and Gary has Nick's book uh, at Oakland, has really started out very, very well at the meet. We saw him win at least a race yesterday while we were covering things, and, and he had had seven winners, and, and so he's starting out very well, and hopefully and Gary will have a, a good winner there. Um, but you got, got no choice. You just got to go. A real jewel, her most recent. This is late August at, at Delaware, so it's been a little while. She's fresh. She outbroke everyone established a clear lead and watch her get just swarmed in the stretch and eventually gets nipped late. <laughs> yeah, um, this is this is a tough loss. Um, one of the things we like about, about Oakland is too, they come from all over the place. It's not mm -hmm. quite the same as Saratoga, but you do see them coming in from a lot of different tracks. It's a melting Canterbury, pot. It's a you melting see pot. The, the, you know, you'll see Remington Park. Um, you see in Delaware, we're seeing someone, and listen, the purses are terrific, and it's all dirt racing, so I get why people go there. The only problem with Oakland is it's not easy to get to. If Oakland were easier to me. get to, you'd want to go there more often, you know? <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I, I recommend to people you fly to Memphis, because you, you can get drive. a direct flight. It's an easy drive. And then drive, yeah. Yeah, it's three hours, but, uh, but, it's, but it's a really fun track to go to, and, and, and obviously with the purses, it's, it's lucrative for people to go there in the winter. If you have a track that's out on an island and in those same conditions, it's the same horses taking turns beating each other. You can almost predict which horses are going to show up in a particular race. It's nice to have that melting pot with horses coming from all over the place. No question. That's what makes it really interesting. You're right. If you get a situation where, I mean, at a certain point, it's like... It's one of the things that's hurt harness racing, I think, over the years. Um, the same horses constantly competing, the same circumstances. You know, one of the things that makes our racing at Naira so much interesting, turf and dirt, different distances. You, know, you think of Belmont Park, we can run you know, pretty much any distance on the turf courses. Um, it, it moves things around. But with Oaklawn getting all these shippers, it makes it for a much more interesting puzzle. You used to get that a lot more in Gulfstream when they would just have that winter meet. You know, yep. for 10 or 11 weeks, you would get, everybody would be excited to go down there. You'd point for the meet and it would be a lot of fun. You get a little bit of it at Keeneland more in the spring than the fall. Mm -hmm. And here with the purses offered at Oak Lawn and allowance races, 106,000, maiden races, 90,000. And a little bit later on today, the uh, three-year-olds in the Smarty Jones first step towards the Arkansas Derby. We'll have it for you right here on I, America's Day at the Races. I'm going to make my case for Italian justice. I don't All always right, shoot, love the shippers shoot. coming in here, but I thought that this pace could be at least honest in here, and I thought she might get a good trip sort of sitting behind the one and five, and she's not so slow that she can't make her own position coming out of five and five and a half for long races, and I think it's arguable she's been running against some better horses out of town. She gets a little bit of class relief in this field, and I just think I don't, I don't love her chances here, but I think 10 to one's a good price. I, I'm not going for a girl like me. I, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope she wins for Tom. But I, I want to see Tom win more races. He doesn't run as many at Oaklawn. He obviously, his home in the winter is fairgrounds. The purses are so good, it's hard to resist. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not thrilled with her, and I'm worried for the five that she may have to deal with the one. Princess Dream says it two to one. A girl like me for Tom Amos. Good luck, Tom. The two to one actual choice as they file into the gate. Watch a real jewel down inside and the speed she figures to flash early on in this six furlong dash. Vic Stoffer with the call. It is the fourth live from Oakland Park. Moy Hey Lady. They're at the post. They're off. Awkward start, a girl like me. A Real Princess and Prince Dream says these two speed out and match race up the back stretch. Then Lady Astrid, followed by Super Wonder Girl and Italian Justice. Moyhe Lady and Chasing Shadows. And the bad start has a girl like me at the back of the pack. Prince Dream says clears off from A Real Jewel. Prince Dream says in charge into the far turn. It's a three length lead. A Real Jewel is second, a length and a half to Italian Justice. Splitting horses is Super Wonder Girl and Lady Astrid at the rail. Then it's another three back to Chasing Shadows and Moy Hey Lady. Six back to A Girl Like Me. Prince Dream Sis has the lead. At the quarter mile marker, she's a length and a half in front. A Real Jewel comes back at her now from the outside to try to re-engage. Prince Dream Sis a length. A Real Jewel is second. Two and a half to Italian Justice in third. Then comes Super Wonder Girl, Prince Dream Sis, and a resurgent A Real Jewel. Down at the rail, Super Wonder Girl's got a chance as well as she dives through from the inside and here comes Super Wonder Girl. Prince Dream Sis trying to race ride Super Wonder Girl, but she just cannot hold her off. 
Super Wonder Girl in front. Super Wonder Girl beat Prince Dreamsis. Ariel Jewel was third. Close for fourth. Moihe Lady and Italian Justice. Pretty sure I heard Paul say something about taking a shot with Super Wonder Girl. Around 7-1 to one last we saw Orlando Mojica. 8-1 to one at post time. Dives towards the rail. Big opening down there. And she runs down the leader, Princess Dreamsess. Paul, his opinion has been sharp all fall when he was down at Churchill Downs. I've only been with him for a few races so far at Oakland, but he's, he's had a, a number of nice priced winners. And she got a very good ride by Mojica and a nice trip, but she gets it done at 8-1. Uh, to one. Eight to one. So congrats. And, you know, it's funny. Watching the race, it played out exactly as I would hoped it would. The one engaged the five enough to make her go too fast early. My three was sitting in a perfect spot. They came in the stretch. I thought I made a very good bet with the three. The only problem was she's just not very good. Yeah, <laughs> so. I was wait, so I thought she was hanging because she hadn't switched. And when she switched, I said, now she'll accelerate. Yeah, she just We was, didn't see it. She just had nothing, you know. But for, listen, that's the way it works out. And for Super Wonder Girl, her best races have been when she's on or near the lead. Like, where's her tactical speed? She was farther back again today, but did something this afternoon. She hasn't been doing She finished. She did. She did. And she got a very nice ride coming up the rail. I've watched enough races there, but it's certainly uh, not hard to believe the rail is okay, considering the race that she ran. Not saying it's an advantage. We haven't really watched enough races, but nice pick, Paulie. This one worked out nicely for you. Five to one at post time. Russell, owned by King Honor Stable, graduating in her 11th, 12th career start. Yeah, and I thought Louis Rodriguez Castro did a nice job of uh, getting the source into position so that she could make her run. As it turned out, she got enough pace in front of her and just was able to run them down. She found the right field to get it done. So congrats to her and her connections for getting the win. Had a, you know, I, I don't think this was such a smart pick by Jonathan and I. I just think we got an overlay. She's not supposed to pay $13. She should have paid 7 or 8 Big number. Yeah. Didn't cost the favorite, but mostly harmless, as you saw. Shaved twice in the stretch. Russell, 13-20. Fellini completing the exacta and affilata. It was a very Italian. Uh, the whole thing, <laughs> Russell, the whole thing. <laughs> I, right. How did Richie not crush this number? What's going on here? Whenever I see affilata, I think of affrigata, which is my favorite dessert. Do you have affrigata? No. Espresso poured over ice, vanilla ice cream? Not a big dessert guy. Shockingly, I am. Do you know the household I grew up in? Yeah, not a big true. dessert guy. Yeah, that would be a problem for me. Yeah. Pick yeah. six and the mandatory Didn't payout. Didn't Mitch's place. Nope. <laughs> Turn the page. Race seven. The What'd Briars you race him, actually. What, what'd you come up with here? Who do you like? I, I took Tenebris, the one. Um, I wanted to bring up something, and maybe Jonathan has some thought of this. I'm not a weight guy, but I'll tell you something interesting about Tenebris and the five major spin. They ran together, and they hit the wire together last time. There's an 11-pound switch. Tenebris is picking up six and major spin is dropping five. So if you're a weight guy, maybe you like the five over the one. I'm not, and I prefer the one, Tenebris. Horses in the paddock. We'll check in with Richie, a paddock report when we come back. Seventh race, Aqueduct. And for jockey Dylan Davis, what a year for Davis, the Manhattan, uh, Manhasset born rider. Naira's leading rider in 2022. A big, big honor riding a couple of contenders later on in the program. Three hundred thousand, two seventy-five. Medium, two hundred seventy-five thousand, seventy-five. Good to get seventy-five. Two hundred seventy-five thousand, two hundred fifty. I'm Ralph now. Two hundred fifty thousand. You're good to get two, but two, but two hundred thousand dollar. Who are you betting on? How about an app created specifically for horse racing? Nairo Bets. We specialize in thundering hooves, fist pumping, and boosting your bankroll with robust weekly promotions. And offer betting tips from actual horse racing experts. Bet all day and night, nationwide. Get the action and thrill of horse racing with Naira Bats. take pride in what we do. For me, it's more of a passion than actual work. I'm an assistant trainer. Carpenter. I'm a peace officer. I'm a jockey. I'm a gardener. 
I'm a groom. Clocker. Assistant starter. Trainer. ESL teacher. I love what I do. There's so many jobs that come together every day. It's a collective effort that really makes this ball go round. We are real racing! I couldn't imagine working anywhere else. For me, riding horses in the morning is the best thing I can do. New York racing helps support my small business. It's extremely important to the New York economy. Like my dream come true. This is like a big family. We are New York Horse Racing. Happy New Year from all of us at America's Day at the Races. As always, brought to you in part by Naira Betts, but any track, anywhere, anytime with Naira Betts. Get started, NairaBets.com today. So the um, envelopes that will continue to unveil Game of Silks. Andy unveiled a $1.3 million colt yesterday into his stable. It hasn't been quite as kind for Richard Migliori, but Mig, I understand you have your envelope with you, and we're going to reveal uh, the next horse headed into your stable. I'm going uh, to pull it out from behind here. I've already taken out the envelope, but I haven't looked yet, guys. No, but isn't this the same one? <laughs> I think I think it did quite a bit better this time around, guys. What you got? Th 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 this one that looks, looks serious. Better. By Gunrunner out of Crohn's Mistress. A lot of black type on the female side of this family. Gunrunner has just been one of the hottest sires going. He's right up there to me with Into Mischief. Uh, and this is a filly by Gunrunner. Her, she's already named Gunrunner's Mistress. And this is one to get excited about because there's a lot of precocity in this family. And this is one... We may see early. I, I, I'm very, very pleased here. I got all my clothes for Christmas out of the way, and now I got something that I can unwrap and be pretty, pretty excited about. I'm pretty happy with this one. This one's exciting, Richie. I, I wonder who, do we know who bought this horse? You know, um, and Andy, I don't. I just opened this up, so hopefully yeah. you can find out, and um, hopefully that she races in our jurisdiction, because I'd love to see her. This is, a, this is a very interesting prospect. I mean, anytime you just see Gunrunner, your eyes light up. Who bought it? Oh, this horse Clarmich. is actually owned by, uh, by my friends at Clarman, so uh, it's a Clarmich horse. Oh, wow, so, that's even better. Uh, I, oh. have to, I can get us a little information on how this one, Richie, so we'll have to keep up on that. It's Fantastic, exciting. and I'll get to go to the barn and, and get a look at her up, up close and personal. I'm going to tell you right now, I'll be very interested to see what this name this horse actually runs with because it doesn't sound like one of the names they may new, use, but sometimes they'll keep the name. This one has to be right. about five times worth what your previous all of them combined to this point. Uh, it's worth about 10 times more than yeah. the three previous combined. <laughs> but hey, you know what? Like we said yesterday, you never know where a good horse is going to come from. I mean, it was pretty unlikely that a jockey was going to come from Gravesend, Brooklyn, uh, and do as well as I did here in New York. So I, I, I don't want to be too harsh on them. Well, I'm going to get to work and find out what I can about this horse, Richie. This is exciting. No, that's awesome. Thank you. That's great. I, I'm, I'm really pleased. Listen, guys, I told you, I, I'm excited about this game. It's so much fun. I hope people get involved. It's a way to really kind of get involved and learn more about the game. That website, uh, silks.io, the 3D interactive website uh, where the metaverse meets horse racing ownership. Great stuff. Exciting prospect. And Richie's stable. Again, yeah. Andy has so far the, the shiny, the shiny new object, the shiny toy. No, I'm, I'm excited about this going. one because I know the connections and mm -hmm. have the horse so I can find out how she's doing and uh, we'll see if they're going to use that name or another one. Game of Silks. <laughs> and we have several more envelopes yeah. to open over the course of the afternoon. And we have horses in the paddock for the seventh. We do. Six and a half furlong sprint. You run with, who was it again? The horse who's favorite, Tenebr is it Tenebris? Tenebris. Tenebris down on the rail. I thought this horse ran very well. I, I really think there's a real possibility that the rail was, was not the place to be on December 3rd. This was Cigar Mile Day. And, and, and basically, he was pinned right down on it. Now, unfortunately, he draws it again. And that's a bit problematic for him. I almost wonder if Built to Last might be able outruns him, and if he gets enough of a break and Built to Last outruns him, maybe Jose Lascano can get outside of Built to Last, and that'll mitigate things for him. So I'm going to hope that happens in here. I'm not running the windows at five to two. I don't have an argument with cousin Andrew, who I think is a major player, especially with speed. And I don't think Holy Spin is major spin is impossible here. So I, I don't really have a major argument for or against any of the horses taking money in here. A significant defection, blinding light, yep. who was out considered a contender. Is, is how do you feel about the two to one though on Tenebris? I'm not betting a two to one. No. I'm not because because the horse has to make its own trip, you know, and I think you have to be very, very I, there's nothing more important as a horse player 
than being aware of prices. And you, you, you know, you cannot marry yourself and saying, "I'm betting Seattle Slough today." And yeah. you, and you, you know, the morning line is four to one, and you look at it and you think, "Yeah, the horse will be second or third choice." I'm going to look at it seventy-four to one, and the horse is two to one, and you say, "Well, I like this horse. I'm going to bet it. I can't live with myself. It doesn't." Let it win. Let them win at two to one. You're, you're, you're just not giving yourself any room. You've got to, prices. It, handicapping is one thing, but you've got to be in a position where you don't have to be right that often to make money. It's a similar conversation that we had about 20 minutes ago with mostly harmless and conceding even money on an 18 race maiden. Exactly. Listen, I like the horse prisoner in the fourth race that went off at eight to five, and I thought the horse would be like third choice. I didn't bet. I said so on Twitter. Tenna Briss, there he is, two to one current favorite. Yeah, no, I, listen, I don't think he's supposed to be more than three to one in this race, but I think two to one is a little bit on the low side for me, especially given the rail draw. Built to last, responded well to being disqualified, came back and won by 10, cousin Andrew. A late runner, Kendrick Carmouche, knows him well. Yes, I know, I know the real cousin Andrew. He's been on our show before. He's a wonderful man. Um, I think he may benefit from, from pace in here, and frankly, this is an easier spot than the one he was in last time. We saw Holy Matrimony. Another look at Major Spin. Honest, tries hard. The wins haven't come easy. No, but you know what? Now he can have an easier stalking spot. He doesn't have to do the dirty work against Tenebris because of the number two built to last. So maybe that makes his life easier. Gaslight kind of one paced, kind of one geared. Yeah, I just didn't think he was quite good enough. He got a pretty good trip last time out and just wasn't good enough. Something different for what a dude first start on a fast dirt track. He's going to need something different, a new engine. <laughs> something. <laughs> Liam's fire. Katie Davis riding for Amir Shashakli here. This is not an impossible horse at a price. If you want a horse at a price, uh, the trainer, Amir Shashakli, has been very hot. Her barn had been going extremely well in December. She's five for 26 with a dollar 87 ROI turning back. Those are big numbers for yep. her. And even though he's won going longer before, the two turn mile and eighth is too much for him. He didn't really run that badly last time and now cuts back. I'm not in love with him, but I think there's an argument that you can be made for him to at least use him at a price if you're looking for one in here. 12 to one outsider, perhaps a live long shot. JK, you did some fine work in the last race with a $13 winner. What are we doing here? Yeah, look, I'm going to talk about two horses. I'm going to pick the five, but I want to start with the three, Cousin Andrew. Um, I just think like this horse ended up working out a nice trip, kind of sitting in behind the speed, tactical enough to kind of stay connected. You get Kendrick in here, and I just, you know, sit in behind these horses, and maybe when they get a little bit tired, there's a lot of them. I don't quite trust some of their performances, whether they took place on a sloppy racetrack, so on or so forth. I, I think Cousin Andrew is at least interesting at the prices that you're getting now on the board. I think this horse will probably creep up from that three to one as well. But I'm going to pick the five. Uh, major spin, and, and, I, and it's had nothing to do with the point that Andy made, but I do like that point about them switching the weights. Very good observation, and I'm not much of a weight person, but they were both involved uh, in paces last time that w was pretty honest. The, the pace was pretty quick, and, and I do think the switching of the post positions with major spin kind of being towards the outside, I, I think that this could work out well, and I think the rider change is another thing with, with that weight. It's just a little bit easier when you're not, you know, if you're really running throughout an entire race, it is a big weight switch. So uh, I, I like the draw for this horse. This horse also has major spin, has a couple of back races that actually kind of uh, match that performance. I'm a little bit questionable whether or not the slop moved him up, the, 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 the surface moved major spin up get a similar the racetrack with some moisture in it here, but this horse also has some back numbers that kind of fit. So I'm going to go towards the outside. I like the price better with the five major spin as well. I thought this was a tough race. I have nothing against the one. I just thought the five was a better price. Major spin. Uh, you, again, uh, you, what you see is what you get. He tries hard, consistent, honest. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, the point at which on, with a horse like major spin, <coughs> with the other speeds in the competition inside of him, He's not reliant on something like the one, right? I was talking about hoping the two goes and clears and you can get outside. Yeah. Of it. That all may happen, but you're relying on that happening, and it's, it's easier said than done. With the five, he falls into that kind of trip. Three to one, second choice. JK's top selection, major spin. Richie, Tenebris favored at two to one, the quick gelding drawn inside. Yeah, I mean, listen, he looks terrific from a physical perspective, but I, I think the draw 
doesn't do him any favors. And the switch in weights. And it's interesting that Jose Gomez, who rode him last time when he carried 117 and now he carries 123, winds up on the five major spin, which is where I landed. But physically, he looks terrific. He's well turned out. His coat's really, uh, you know, got that rich, lustrous, hy hydrated coat that I look for. The two built to last is in kind of an impressive individual to me because he's a horse that feels to me like he's continued to improve from a physical perspective. He carries his weight good. His coat is great. And it feels like he's really kind of figured this game out. And last time, he didn't even need the lead to be effective. Uh, I, so I, I thought he was a little bit interesting. The five will be my top selection major spin. I like the fact that he now carries 115. He's drawn outside the other main speeds uh, and could not look any better. And I think the nine, Liam's fire, is really touting himself. This is a horse that when he's good, you really see it. He always carries good weight. Looks like he never misses an oat. Um, but his coat is just just so good today and he looks so much like the horse that won four back going six and a half in the mud Amir Shashakli does a really good job and this horse really kind of won me over in the paddock so I, I agree with Andy here if you want a long shot this is an interesting long shot guys a little more smoke to that Liam's fire Andy um yeah I, I just think I don't particularly like Liam's fire but you always want to look at races and see is there somebody to price that you think is worth throwing in. And I think for us up here, the best thing we can do is come up with an idea for a horse like that. It's not necessarily likely to win, but there are players out there betting trifectas and superfectas. We talk about Maggie doing this in the mm -hmm. paddock a lot and Acacia as well. Um, trying to find a price, not good enough to win, but Maggie or Acacia see a horse that hasn't looked that good, that looks really good to them. That's the kind of horse that steps up and still probably not going to be good enough to win. But you get them in the number somewhere and it changes everything. And some horses like always look great and others typically look dull and what Richie's telling you is that he touts himself when he's going to run well he'll give you an indication pre-race and that's what he's saying and given how well that barn is going it's not that surprising her horses have really been running recently so it sort of makes sense and the one thing here is listen you don't want to manufacture opinions it's dishonest to just constantly try to beat favorites on the other hand we have to be careful to not always tell people things they already know you have to walk that line. fine line yeah very fine line. Tenebris, favor drawn inside. Let's see what the long shot does from the outside for Amira Shashakli and Katie Davis. Liam's fire, 20 to 1 at post time. Chris Griffin standing by with the call. Race 7 live. Aqueduct. Last to load will be Liam's fire to the outside. Liam's fire steps forward. All in line. All set. And they're off. Very slow start for major spin at the back end of the field. Tenebris has got early speed. There's Built to Last, and Built to Last is quickest. It's Built to Last who's got the lead. Up on the outside comes Holy Matrimony, who's going to battle for the second position with Tenebris, their second and third. In behind them is the purple cap of Cousin Andrew. Out in the center of the racetrack comes Gaslight. Very wide is going to be What a Dude with Liam's Fire. And after the start, Major Spin is the trailer. They approach a half mile left to go, 22.39. Unopposed on the front end is built to last. Tenebris has gotten off the rail for Jose Lescano, is in the two path, is coming after this leader now. Holy Matrimony is under a full drive from third. The leader's got more, built to last. And Manny Franco, they're still up by a length. Here comes the run from Gaslight four wide. What a dude is trying to follow that move. Also, cousin Andrew. Second to last is Liam's fire and a tall task for Major Spin, who's six off the lead as they approach a quarter mile left to go. 46 seconds flat for that half mile time built to last is still there it is built to last who's trying to take them all the way but tenebris and gaslight have pounced now and gaslight out in the center of the racetrack has taken the lead it is gaslight who is up by a full length tenebris for a final furlong from the back leo's fire is trying to rally on there with holy matrimony it is gaslight in front inside the final 16th gaslight is almost there gaslight at a price gaslight gets the score liam's fire runs up into second then tenebris and built to last in 1 minute 18.21 seconds. I feel gaslit, Andy. Gaslight, who had been just kind of one geared, one paced at 13 to 1 in an upset in Liam's fire. Richie liked what he saw. You like what you saw on paper. For trainer Amir Shockley, 
big effort to complete the exacta at 21 to 1. Yes, Gaslight ruined my day because a nice little 1 9 exacta 9 1 would have oh, gone man. very well. But what can you say? I mean, Gaslight had the right trip, stalking three wide last time with Jose Lascano. He's in perfect spot out in the middle of the track, and he just went backwards behind the pace duel with Tenebris and Major Spin. Major Spin blew the brake, so he mm -hmm. kind of lost all chance at the start in here. And Tenebris, Jose managed to get to the outside. And, you know, even though Gaslight got the edge jump on him, it kind of felt like Jose was biding his time. But this horse just ran away from him. And at the end, Gaslight was drawing away, and Liam's Fire was the one making the run. Good idea with Liam's Fire, but for me, I couldn't get Gaslight in there. Him and Harkey making fun of us. Well, apparently, he's, uh, he's, he, he and Richie are going to be working together. So I've heard a rumor. Yeah. I, I hope in a friendly. big way. Everybody likes Eamon. Maggie loves Eamon. You don't love him right now. In well, this moment, I, understandably why so. Why shouldn't try to win the race? <laughs> I don't ever hold it against a jockey when he needs me. I hold it against him when I bet on them and I feel like they should have won or I want to use them for an excuse for my not winning a bet. I Re don't hold it against riders for beating me. Results when we come back. Trainer Ron Moquette at Oakland off to a blazing start and uh, poised to pad his stats in the upcoming fifth race at Oakland with Cole Spur. You're watching America's Day at the Races. Fox Sports 2. Whatever you use to predict future stallion success, breathe slowly and gaze at the desert's first great championship race. Curlin won it. So did Street Cry, Arrogate, and now in a time even faster than Arrogate's Mystic Guide. The cold hard fact is, after this, he was rated the best horse in the world. Mystic Guide, new to Darley. Gorgeous day in Hot Springs. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. As always, brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. Horses on track, nearing post time for the fifth at Oakland. $10,000 claimers, non-winners to lifetime. Polly's on site. Polly had a 7-1 to shot come through in the last race. Super Wonder Girl. What are we doing here? Yeah, I just think uh, Super Wonder Girl got an overlay. You guys are talking about just getting an overlay at Aqueduct. Whenever you can get Robertina Diodoro at 7-1 to one here, you just got to take it. This race here uh, was confusing to me because I know the 9 Colspur is the horse to beat in here and is, is hammered, actually, when you look into the will pays in the pick fours and pick fives is the lowest. It goes 9-11. And, and, you know, Colspur is a horse that has been voided claim a couple times. When we talk about voided claim is that... People have joined in for to claim the horse and then went back in and avoided the claim. And each time the horse has not really gone to the sideline. Well, actually gone to the sideline both times and has come back okay. And now nobody claimed this horse last time. It was on a muddy racetrack. I thought he should have got the job done. Is, can he win this race? Most definitely. Obviously at three to two. But I just, 
I don't know if I want to take three to two. You know, the seven in here I thought was very interesting. City legend Norman McKnight is a very crafty trainer. This horse is first time ever on dirt. Comes in here with a nice little drill one time over the race. I'm, I'm worried that the horse is getting played just off that one drill, and it could be a tiny bit phony, but I thought that horse was sneaky. Um, you know, the four title shot, you know, this horse won for 16000 went off a long, long layoff, and then lost to Silk Trade and Uber Kirk. Those are really nice horses. Um, you know, now backs up to six furlongs. I don't know how far back he's going to be. I just don't know if I want to take three to one also on him from coming way back, but I just think he warmed up the best for me, and I think he's the one to beat from way off the pace. And Lapis Lazuli, the 11, is taking money first time gelding. His form is just so spotty. And the one win this horse has is by a nostril. And if you go back and look at the replay, I don't even, I still can't believe he won the race. So that's why I'm kind of against the 11 in here, and I'll take the four at seven to two. I'm with Paul. You're with the same, uh, like the same like the title four. shot, yes? I think the nine is over betting here. I also thought the 11. It's funny. I had the race written at the top of my page um, for four eleven nine. So I was sort of with Paulie on the things he was talking about. Interesting thoughts, though, and the horse's one win. And I, I just don't understand why the nine is nine to five. In uh, here. Ron Moquet, that's why. And the, the torrid start that he's off to. He has Cole wow. Spur, uh, his most recent, uh, December 9th at Oakland. Cole Spur, Andy, it was a perfect trip and does everything but win in the mud. Unless you went to Wesley and though the horse that beat that horse, as my sister brother-in-law did, uh, I don't know how you have that horse. And I think, you know, one of the things in handicapping that most of us do, and it's the beauty of using the Daily Race Forms formulator, is you're able to take the PPs apart and look at the horses they ran against. And, man, you look at Wesleyan's PPs, mm -hmm. and they are not pretty. And there's a reason he paid $60 in this race. Does it? Um, is that why you feel Cole Spur is 8-5? to five Because Wesleyan because that horse beat him that day? Because it was close. And it looks like, you know, people, people love, um, there's, in my opinion, close finishes seconds, close finishes, especially when they repeat themselves, are negatives. A lot of players like them. They think the horse is close enough to win. Oh, almost one. Look, it lost really by a length of the quarter, depends. two back, one lost by a neck last time. It really that was... depends. And and yes. real, that's why you really have to watch the races. Yeah, and I think that's one of, you know, you'll see horses that win by big margins and they run slow figures and people will bet them back and they infrequently win. Doesn't mean that this method of that I use is always going to be right. You're, you're wrong a lot. It's just the nature of the game. But in general, you have to look at the quality of the races. And I just thought this horse ran against an extremely weak field. And let's point out something else. Let's look at some of the odds he was. Six to five, four back. Second, beaten five and a half lengths. Mm -hmm. Two back, nine to five. Third, last time, two to one. He's piling up the losses at short prices. And the first book, and really one of the only books I've ever read in handicapping, um, was Picking Winners by Andy Byer. Andy Byer. And one of the things in that book that stuck with me when I read it, and it stuck with me my whole life, is that seconds and thirds are frequently black marks against horses. That losses, especially at short prices, are negatives. When horses start losing races in races they're sort of, quote, mm -hmm. supposed to win, unquote, those are negatives, and yeah, a horse will get a bad trip once and something will happen or a horse explodes. The more they pile them up, it just becomes a bad habit. In this race, they're all uh, one for something. These $10,000 claimers, non-winners, two lifetime. Cole Spirit, nine to five. Four trainer, Ron Moquette. You know, I was talking quite a bit with Irad Ortiz about he had asked about a horse he was riding. He said, why is this horse the favorite? I ran in the jocks room. He's asking me his favorite in the morning line. He said, why is this horse favorite? I said, I pointed at him and I said, you. Because you're riding I said, you're, oh, I said, don't you ever go out there and look at the board and see you're on a horse that's eight to five and think, this horse doesn't look like it should be eight to five. And he said, yes. And I said, well, you're that, a victim of your own success. That adds so much pressure. Yeah. When you're on, you know, for a rider, when you're on a horse who should be, and this happens to the best of them, four, five to one, five to two. It's not fair. No question. It's, it's not a curse fair. of success. Mm -hmm. It happens with trainers. Yep. You'll see it with whether it's Chad Brown, Todd Butcher, Jug McGay, one of the most habitually overbet trainers. And you know, you run a two to one shot and you lose. And I think sometimes you almost feel bad too. You don't you want to don't want to lose. You feel like you let the public down. It's not your fault though if a four to horse supposed to be nine to two goes off at two to one. Here McQuentin with Cole Spur, who's perhaps overbet. We're about to find out. Big stop with the call is post time race five live Oakland. Practical Man and Lapis Lazuli. Last horse to load will be Jesuit.
They're at the post. They're off. Good start for Helephant and Lapis Lazuli. Jesuit is close up. On the move is Practical Man and Galactic Empire. Cole Spur is just midfield. Then comes to the outside and Seaside Boy, followed by Braska. Title shot has moved up a few spots. Mark the Moose, Calipari, and the trailer is Seaside Boy. Into the far turn with Helephant and Galactic Empire. Helephant's ahead in front. Galactic Empire second three quarters of a length to Practical Man. Lapis Lazuli in a good spot for David Cabrera and he's sitting chilly on him. Lapis Lazuli could be challenging for the front by the time they turn for home. Then comes Cole Spur and Jesuit. They've got three lengths to make up. Three back to title shot and here comes Lapis Lazuli all the way up to take over the lead. So Lapis Lazuli is the new leader at the top of the stretch and he's got a length and a half on Jesuit who moves up after him in second. Cole Spur is third, then title shot and they come to the final furlong and title shot emerges and he's trying to run down Lapis Lazuli. Lapis Lazuli a length. Title shot is coming after him now and catching every stride. Lapis Lazuli reaches. Title shot catching. Lapis Lazuli title shot. Lapis Lazuli title shot. Title shot in time to nail Lapis Lazuli on the money. Then Seaside Boy and City Legend. Exciting stretch drive in the fifth at Oaklawn. Lapis Lazuli desperately trying to hold on. Title shot, a late surge. Able to get that elusive second career win. And for you and Pauly, nice four to one winner in this fifth race at Oaklawn. Yeah, and I would say uh, that Pauly would agree with me. We were a little bit lucky because no fault of Cabrera on Lapis Lazuli. And I'm so glad to see him back riding after that injury he had during the meet last year when he looked like he was headed for a leading rider and he, he really would have deserved it. Won the title um, by one race. He did. Oh, yeah, that's by so one race. I remember by one race. Yeah. That's, he, he, you know, so it's, and it's nice to see him back riding. He was victimized by the post in his horse's running style. So he gets caught out a bit wide. It was a great ride by Arietta. Yes. He did everything right. He was patient. He didn't panic. He stayed inside. He saved all the ground. He angled out. He saw the field. He took his chance. They would spread. They spread for him. And believe me, he needed every bit of that trip to get the victory here. So I'm not sure he was the best horse, but Paulie and I are cashing. At four to one, Paulie had a seven to one shot in the fourth. Four to one shot title shot. This one uh, had scratching. Heeman Harkey at a price at Aqueduct just moments ago for a horse that if you look at his running lines gaslight he's never accelerating in the stretch he's never passing yep. everyone he's always essentially in the same exact place and then he goes out and does that at 13 or something to one wet tracks listen you know sometimes they produce odd results in one wet track performance and he's handled them before he just ran a lot better than he did his last start and got it done and congrats to him and harkey and pat quick for getting the win here uh nice run by liam spire and i think you big run katie davis running second it's a good thing someone's got to feed trevor the baby <laughs> that's right you know well, he's sitting in his home probably watching tv not, not gonna be an issue with her soaps. uh Riding, uh, riding like that. Just hoping to get back in about a month. I was texting with him the other day, looking forward to seeing Trevor getting back. Looking forward to seeing him return. Yeah, good man. Turn the page, race eight. Aqueduct, couple of scratches. Monday morning quarterback, Wendell Fong is out. Look at the entry here. Amundsen, Kinetic Sky at three to five. Wouldn't, wouldn't either the one would be six to, I think both the one and one A would be pretty heavily favored mm -hmm. on their own in here. It's a very, very tough entry to get past and I'm not trying to beat them. Formidable entry. That's next. Horses are in the paddock. As our coverage continues, late double from the Big A. Still have the Smarty Jones coming up from Oakland on this New Year's Day. Great to have you with us on America's Day at the Races. We'll be right back. The run happies are hot, hot, hot with his two-year-olds burning up the track. Recent top burns include this growing list of winners at Churchill Downs. Plus the speedy two-year-old coat, Happy is a Choice, a five-length maiden winner at Keeneland. Happy is a Choice, Francisco Arietta to win it. Price for value and turning up the heat. Call today and book your mare to Eclipse champion, Run Happy, standing at Claiborne Farm. Now more than ever, it's time to get with the program. When shopping for your next race prospect, consider that New York Reds start with an advantage. Our New York Reds run for serious green. At Saratoga Race Meet, New York Bred Maidens run for up to $88,000. New York Bred Allowance Horses run for up to $100,000. 
and New York bred owners can collect awards of up to $20,000 per horse per race. So get back with the program. Seriously. City of Light, a multiple grade one winner with 5.6 million in earnings. Winner of the grade one Malibu, the grade one Triple Bend, the grade one Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, posting a 110 buyer, and the grade one Pegasus World Cup, posting a 112 buyer. The best son to date of leading stallion quality road. City of Light stands to continue his sire's legacy at Lane's End. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race. from every track, every track, on every screen, every, screen. Every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. You're watching America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2, brought to you in part by Ron Happy, number one second crop sire last year by Dirt Earnings. Race 8 Aqueduct, and as we mentioned going to break, the entry overwhelming with Amundsen, Kinetic Sky currently 2 to 5. Richie standing by with this paddock report. Richie, what are you noticing from Amundsen and Kinetic Sky? Well, Lafitte, the first thing I'm looking for when I look at horses that are taking a lot of money is some sort of negative, something I can say, mm, not crazy about. I don't see it with either horse. Uh, Admonson is just uh, one of those old time kind of throwback warrior horses, shows up. He's got speed from the inside. He looks fantastic. He's carrying great weight. And I just think the entry, too, has complementing styles. Kinetic Sky on the turn back is going to have as much speed. He's more of a closing type uh, going seven furlongs, I would think, and, and Admonson's speed. So they really complement each other's styles and from a physical perspective, they both are spot, you know, spot on. Flawless, actually. Uh, the horse that would absolutely get the paddock check mark here would be the two. Chestertown. He is just looks like a ball of energy coiled up ready to be released i don't think i've ever seen him he's always a good looking horse i don't think i've ever seen him look this good this is like a whole nother level for chestertown coming off the layoff and he looks dead fit to me i don't think that's going to be an issue whatsoever lafitte chestertown expensive 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 six-year-old now he's trained by steve asmussen Andy, unraced since May is Chestertown. What are the numbers, what do the stats say about Asmussen trained runners off long layoffs in dirt races in New York? Much as it pains me in this case, because I, 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 I'm very fond of Toby Sheets and think he's a terrific trainer, it should be Toby up there because I think it's very important when looking up stats for the Asmussen Barn in New York to separate Saratoga from Belmont and Aqueduct. Because at Saratoga, you get the Asmussen, you know, team Asmussen coming in. The ones in New York, Belmont and Aqua, for the most part, are mostly ones that Toby Sheets takes care of. And in looking them up, horses coming off five to nine month layoffs. I like the layoff two months on either side, seven mm -hmm. months, this horse. He's 0 for 12 with three hitting the board. So it shows that they often need a race. And I think that's a case with a lot of Asmussen runners. You'll often see them need a race before they start running their better races. I don't like Chestertown anyway. Listen, he's a six to one outsider if you like him. It just says those numbers that maybe he needs one. Two million dollar <laughs> gelding. By Super Stallion Tappet, big fan of his mother, Artemis Argatera, and the top class sprinter that she was. Um, ours. Th th this horse, the best day, this is a year removed from the best day for the connections. The day that she turned five and the $2 million purchase price left the racing form PPs. Because until the horse was five, used to be listed, she got, it just didn't work out for this horse. They spent a lot of money. The second fall of Mars Magritera, Peter Brandt bought that horse in Saratoga, I think with Medaglia Doro for half a million. She ran okay for Chad Brown, but she never really panned out as well. And Mars Magritera was a terrific grade one mm -hmm. horse for trainer Mike Hushin and Chester Broman, who bred this horse and stayed in for a little bit of a piece. He's just been a bit of a disappointment. He's not impossible here, but you got a tough situation where Amundsen is now the controlling speed, given the scratches, and maybe the best horse. And Kinetic Sky, off his last race, is his main competition, and he's his entry mate. So this is a very tough entry to beat. Two starts back, November 12th, right here, and Amundsen uh, runs his rivals right off their feet. 
Um, yeah, you know, this is, I show this race because it's two back for him when he does it. Mm -hmm. He beat stage left, and he probably was lucky to beat Nova Rags, who disappointed the other day as a short price. Um, but still, he ran very well. Now, he lost last time, and that was seven, and today's seven. And he really didn't have a massive excuse last time. I still think he's the one to beat, and I think that Kinetic Sky is his is, is competition. I mean, I don't think, think stage left is impossible, and I think stage left should be the second choice in here. I have no idea why anybody would bet Milton the Monster in this race. I think he's got to improve immeasurably to be competitive here. And I think stage left will get a more aggressive ride from Eric Cancel, which might close the gap a bit from the race we just saw. The question is for viewers and maybe handicappers newer to the game it's it's you play the hand you're dealt and, and how do you handicap like how do you play these types of races and we'll get to that shortly but a post parade brewing for this eighth race at aqueduct call to post favorite entry amundsen kinetic sky another look at amundsen who scratched out of friday's graves end i believe to run here uh yeah one of, one of quite a few that scratched out of the one graves end. Of 12 down to five uh, yeah i'm He's just in a terrific form. I mean, it doesn't really matter what barn he was in. He started, you know, running well for, for Horacio de Paz up in Saratoga, claimed by Rob Atris, won one for two with him, and now Linda's had him. He's two races, and he's been running terrifically. He's a, he's a fast horse, and he's, he's, he's way the horse to beat. Another look at the $2 million gelding a moment ago, Chestertown. Milton the Monster. First half of the claim, Tom Morley. Yeah, and he's going to have to improve for Tom. He got it done last time, but he ran an 80 buyer, and his last five figures are 80 or below, and that's just not even close to getting it done here. I have no idea why he's the current second choice. To me, he might be the least likely winner of this race. Stage left, who you saw, a wire-to-wire -wire winner right here late November. I made a big bet on him last time, and I don't say it to brag. I say that I got very lucky because Outlaw Kid who ran second, stumbled badly at the start and had to circle the field. And Eric gave this horse this great ride. He saw that there was no pace and he sent him up the rail and was able to slow pace. And the heavy favorite in there had one of the worst stumbles you'll ever see. Mm -hmm. I mean, he literally almost went down. It was a miracle that I read Ortiz stayed on. So he was fortunate last time. But I do think that Eric will probably learn from that race two back and realize I've got to get him more into the race. I bet him two back and I think it's six to one. He's the only alternative I could use. I have no idea why he's the longest shot on the board. So uh, JK, I'll ask you, small field, overwhelming entry, odds on. How do you handle this? How do you play this? Well, I mean, I think you look for, I think you want to be alive, hopefully in the pick six with the one single, the one and the one A, the entry, uh, or the pick five or, or a multi-race play. I, I wouldn't, I don't love betting horses like this at one to two to win, but I do think that uh, this entry is going to be tough. The one Amundsen, he's shown how tough he is throughout his entire career. That's one thing you'll remember in his races that he wins. Someone always looks him in the eye and he turns him away. And I, I love a, a tough speed horse like that drawn towards the inside. I know there's this kind of idea that maybe he doesn't love seven furlongs, but he's run well it's not like he's run poorly and I think if you get him in the right scenario where he can kind of get out there and be aggressively ridden and kind of cruise along and get everyone else off the bridle I think that kind of plays into his hands and I think he will be aggressively ridden considering the fact that Linda has two horses uh Amundsen who I would project would be towards the front and then Kinetic Sky who's used to running a little bit further he's tactical but doesn't need to be on the lead so I feel like they'll probably be a little bit more uh passive with kinetic sky and be more aggressive with Amundsen and I think that aggression is going to help Amundsen so my official pick will be the one but I do think the 1A is an outstanding insurance policy yeah and as Richie was discussing this as well their running styles and how they do complement one another yeah I mean that's you we have an entry where you have one that can stalk and one that's the controlling speed I mean we're sitting here all telling you what geniuses we are that we like the <laughs> two to five shot but once again the worst thing you can do is always try to beat these. We can point out possible flaws, but this is not a position I think where any of us feel you should be betting against this horse. I will say, and I don't know what the exactas are, if the one six, one six, one six exacta is the biggest exacta, which I doubt, and I'll take a look, um, I would say that is the value in here. It's uh, $8 for a dollar, which frankly I don't, for two dollars, which I don't think is that bad. And that's how you'd play this race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Richie, you've kept your eyes on uh, Amundsen, yes? 
Yeah, I mean, he warmed up terrific under Dylan Davis, and he just looks like the controlling speed, and it's just too tough to get past him. I'm with J.K. I, I like Admonson best, and you know, you got a good insurance policy with Kinetic Sky. And, you know, it, and it's incumbent upon Dylan Davis to, to – the art of riding a front runner is establishing the lead. Don't entertain anybody early that, you know, give them uh, any sort of incentive or, or make them feel like they might have a shot at it. Establish it. Make the lead, then get your horse in the right rhythm, and don't slow them down so much that you're putting everybody else back in the race, but save enough horse, and at some point, when you've built an advantage, use the advantage. Start marching on. I don't like when riders wait on the closers. So, in essence, your strategy becomes, I'm going to outkick the kickers. I want to take them off the bridle, I want to spread them out, and I want them getting tired chasing me at some stage. That doesn't mean to go out all out the entire way. So Admonson, obviously, short price. I will say the six stage left made a great impression warming up. Uh, didn't stand out to me in the paddock. Liked him more on the track. Uh, Matt Kentermasi is here. His brother Ilke. Nice to see Matt back after his world tour of racetracks and uh, just always uh, enjoying to talk to them and seeing them. Just a, uh, brothers that really uh, are good people and do a really good job with their horses. It's a, it's a great story that we documented during Saratoga this summer. Uh, Richie, really quickly wanted to circle back to Dylan Davis, New York Racing Association's leading rider in 2022. Um, how significant? What does, that, what does that mean? Well, it's a big deal. You take a lot of pride in it. You know, it's one thing to lead for a meet or, you know, have a meet. And he won his first meet last year, the winter meeting here. But to show the consistency to do it throughout the year. Now, listen, he digs in, stays here all year. He's going to have an advantage about being lead and rider. But so did Manny Franco. So did a lot of other people. So I think it just speaks to Dylan's consistency and his maturity. He's developed into a very consistent rider. Well-deserved. 2022 leading rider in New York, Dylan Davis aboard Amundsen here. We're all set for the eighth. Chris Griffin standing by with the call. Post time, eighth race from the Big A. All in line. All set. And they're off. Amundsen Scott early speed from the inside draw. There's stage left. They're a clear one, two. In between horses will be Milton the Monster. Then comes the Big Gray. That's Chestertown, who's second to last. And Kinetic Sky is the trailer. Amundsen's got the lead, is up by three quarters of a length. Stage left is stalking right there in second. Chestertown moves closer, is in behind the leaders now. Challenges for that third spot with Milton the Monster, who's in a tight spot there in between horses, is at a last. Kinetic Sky, two lengths to cover them all. Tightly bunched, 23 seconds flat. It's Amundsen. At two to five, Amundsen's got the lead will get set to take him into the far turn with four furlongs left to travel stage left is right there engaged to the outside chestertown is waiting for room at the rail here comes the run from kinetic sky and milton the monster is still there and they're still tightly bunched amundsen is in front trying to split rivals milton the monster is looking for a seam and there is a seam there is in the two path is coming after the leaders now stage left is three wide kinetic sky is going to be four wide chestertown is now the trailer 46.104 across the racetrack and still having more is amundsen who kicks for home at the top of the stretch making that bold move was milton the monster who continues to chase now out in the center of the racetrack with stage left kinetic sky chestertown still two and a half off the lead a furlong left to go milton the monster up on the outside of amundsen who battles on for a final 16th kinetic sky is trying to join them up on the grandstand side milton the monster resilient and gets the score milton the monster over kinetic sky who's in a photo with amundsen then came stage left in a photo with Chestertown at 1 minute 24.23 seconds. Milton the Monster, first after the claim, Tom Morley in this eighth race at Aqueduct, 4 to 1 at post time. Gonna play bigger than that in the exotics. I agree in the pick six. This is yeah. a big priced horse. And considering who won the race before, it'll be interesting to see who's alive in that mandatory payout for all six. You might be able to scoop, you know, or at least get part of the carryover for five. And I know Maggie, I'm expecting Maggie's going to text me and say, I should never come to the track. My husband wins when I'm not there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Congrats. I couldn't have been more wrong. I didn't like this horse at all. I thought this horse was a lead pipe cinch to finish last in here, to be honest with you. And I'll tell you, like, this horse significantly improved off the claim. Now, he's got back form that makes him a contender, but none of his last five races make him even a mild contender in here. Now, he got a terrific ride for Manny and a perfect trip, but this horse really moved forward for Tom, so congrats to him. And we'll even say congrats to Maggie, who will be back, I think, Saturday. She said she didn't want to be here. I don't make the schedule around here, man. I'm not sure. Well, she said she didn't want to be here when you were here. That's... 
A consistent narrative I'm catching on to. Yeah, well, Richie's the only one that likes you. <laughs> Four to one. Milton the Monster, the upset here in the eighth race. Aqueduct will have those results when we come back. Much more from Oakland. Milton the Monster, first after the claim. Tom Morley, Manny Franco in the eighth of nine at Aqueduct. Exciting New Year's Day of racing on America's Day at the Races. Welcome back. As always, coverage brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. About four minutes out, race number six. Live look, Alexandros at nine to two. Back out to Gary Stevens, Paul LaDuca. Polly with a hot hand, looking for a third straight winner on the afternoon. No pressure, Polly. Yeah, no pressure at all. But Gary's been helping me out, too, as well. He gave me a couple tips on a couple of these other horses as well. Listen, the three right now at even money, one for Richie. Uh, Gary, it's a dangerous proposition. You know, he's very, very fast. He got left out of the gate last time, and he might have to deal with Jackman early. Yeah, now I mean, with that down to the inside post position, Jackman is very fast as well. He can put some pressure on him, sets it up for a horse. For me, Lieutenant Junior Grade. Yeah, yeah Lieutenant Junior Grade, uh, a horse that got claimed, and you know, probably didn't like the sloppy racetrack. Exactly. And Thomas Van Berg's having a good meet so far. Yeah, he's uh, having an outstanding meet so far uh, early in the meet. But, um, yeah, I, that's, I just threw out that last race at Churchill Downs on that sloppy track. First time he'd run on a sloppy track. You throw that Keeneland race back in where he claimed him for $40,000. Nice win. Corey Lannery rode that day, getting the hot hand of uh, Rafael Bejarano today. And there's just a lot of horses that just love to win races here, Gary. Even the five, Ernie Banker, a nine-time winner, and he's on a roll, too. Yeah, uh, Jackman, he's won two out of five, two places here. Uh, seven for 13, one for Richie. Uh, first time for Lu uh, Lieutenant Junior uh, grade, but a horse that's won pretty much everywhere he's been. Yeah, this race kind of reminds me of the race before. If they can engage one for Richie, I'm kind of with Gary here. I think Lieutenant Jenner Grade's got a big shot to maybe make to, uh, pick up the pieces. But I do think the five is going to be tough in here, um, Ernie Banks. Yeah, and the, the odds are drifting up on uh, one for Richie right now. Well, now back down to nine to five, but nine to two on your four horse Lieutenant Junior Grade. And Alexandros, the one, any love for him? Because he's taking a ton of money at the window. I think maybe the people thinking if it does heat up, that's the horse that launches from way back? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, eight year old gilding. Right, eight. Yeah, he's, he's run a lot. Uh, but he does know how to win races, 40 starts, nine wins, five seconds. 
Uh, not for me down from that one hole. Yeah, guys, I, I think Gary and I are going to stick with the four here at a nice little price here at 9-2. to two. Lieutenant Junior Grade. Holly had a seven to one winner about an hour ago, a four to one winner in the last race along with Andy. Andy, what did you uh, come up with here? I, I think the four is an interesting horse. Um, I, I think the three is over bet at nine to five. I think he's going to get some pressure from Jackman in here and that's going to work out against him. You know, the three and four are both the same sort of boat, right? They both ran poorly last time, but they both ran on sloppy tracks. So you're hoping with them getting back to a fast track will help. So I have no argument with the four. I didn't have a strong opinion here. I think Ernie Banker is a funny horse. Ernie Banker was claimed from New York. Yeah. And the knock on Ernie Banker was he doesn't win. Right, and he bread. has won eight of his last <laughs> 11 races. He was one for 14, and then he's eight for his last 11. I think I bet him first time down there, and he finished second. I said, of course he finished second. He's Ernie, he's Banker. Ernie Banker. He Banker. never wins. <clears throat> and it's sort of amazing to look at the turnaround he has had racing out of town. But this New York bred, I want to say he ran for John Kimmel. Richie can feel free to correct that, but I feel like originally, at the very least, he was with John Kimmel. He's uh, rattled off four straight, seeking a fifth. Ernie Banker at five to one, one for Richie. Go back to his last win. Uh, this was two starts back. Horseshoe Indy, one for Richie. Uh, and in command from the start, uh, where he, he beats Hollis, among, uh, among others, on that afternoon. The, one of the things that bothers me with him is his two big figures in his four good races were at five and a half furlongs. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Yep. Five and a half furlongs at times can be not particularly predictive or as predictive going forward. And now it's six. Now he has been a horse that's taken pressure before and still been able to win even at six furlongs. And he does figure to face some pressure from the seven Jackman. But a lot is going to depend on how aggressive Torres is with the number seven Jackman. Because if one for Richie is allowed to control, he's going to be tough to beat. A fast seven year old. 13 time winner and again outfooted Hollis in that horseshoe Indy race early November all adds up to a two to one favorite. Uh, it was John Kimmel. There we've we been know. told um, just heard from Maggie who said that the reason that her husband was able to win the last race is she and the girls got caught in the Belt Parkway. They were trying to come for the horse. She said my husband can thank the Belt Parkway <laughs> sent me a little video of the girls. They were all happy for the win. And uh, happy new year, of course, to Maggie and, and Tom better, and everybody. Better to but, not uh, be here and win than be here and lose. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it's nothing better than winning. And I think, I think Maggie will be back with us Saturday. So looking forward to seeing her come back. That was, again, that four to one, and it felt like a much bigger uh, upset. Yeah, everybody is covered, but I think the eight horse in this race in the pick six. Once again, the whole pool has to be paid out. But the smallest payout, the pick six, 27,000 with the three, who I thought was a pretty odd horse to be favored in the pick six. The carryover aqueduct because yesterday's late pick four was canceled. So the mandatory payout in the pick six today in the Queens County to be run next Saturday at Aqueduct. Lake pick four time here at Oaklawn and in just over an hour, the first of the local Kentucky Derby prep races, the stepping stone towards the Arkansas Derby, the Smarty Jones. You'll see it live right here on Fox Sports 2. Post time for the sixth race, Oaklawn. Here's Vic Stoffer. Last to load, number nine. They're at the post. They're off. Soaring Bird and one for Richie Breakwell. Stefano away in a third, then Freudian Fate. And between horses goes Lieutenant Junior Grade. Then comes Jackman, followed by Exa Alexandros and Ernie Banker. And the trailer is Jim and Jim. It's one for Richie, fastest up the backstretch, a two length lead on Soaring Bird and Lieutenant Junior Grade. Then comes Freudian Fate. Stefano is f fifth and about four from the front with Ernie Banker just inside of him and Jackman. And here's Jackman now within five of the front. Three back to Alexandros. Now Ernie Banker is second to last and 10 off the lead. Jim and Jim is the trailer and one for Richie is the uncontested leader. One for Richie at the quarter mile marker with a solid three length advantage over Soaring Bird in second. Then comes Freudian Fate and to the outside Stefano Stefano and they come to the final first along with one for Richie, but here comes Soaring Bird trying to run him down, and Alexandros is moving from the back of the pack, and he's got some forward momentum as well. One for Richie has the lead. Soaring Bird's rally has stalled, but here's Alexandros through from the inside. One for Richie. Alexandros might have him. He does. Alexandros in the final stride to beat one for Richie. Then Soaring Bird and Jackman.
The danger was to the inside. Alexandros ambushing the favorite one for Richie in the sixth race at Oak Lawn Park and a driving exciting finish. Paulie was asking a similar question to the one I had. Why was this horse taking money in here? Because I thought she looked slow as well and they knew. She did a nice run and a nice ride from Ricardo Santana and expect him and his new agent Jimmy Riccio to have a very, very good meet down at Oak Lawn Park. He's done so well there in the past. No excuse for one for Richie. I mean, you can say six furlongs got a little late on him, but he was controlling up front. I thought he was home. Yep, I agree. On the inside, Alexandros Ricardo Santana by a long neck, picking off one for Richie. 11 to 1, Alexandros at post. So time. drifted up. Paulie was talking about taking some money, but obviously drifted up. Once again, another horse had some back form, but this horse's form recently. I'm not exactly sure what you liked about what to like about this horse, but she got it done today. Pretty upset good. to kick off the late pick for Oaklawn. Uh, here in upset as well. First after the claim. Tom Morley, congrats. Maggie and Tom, Milton the monster. And right here, you're looking at Amundsen, and he was, Dylan Davis was having to work earlier than he would have liked to. Seven furlongs is too far for him. He didn't have any excuse in here. His entry mate, no excuse either. He didn't do a lot of running in here. Milton the monster did. Terrific ride by Manny Franco, sat the pocket, came out, perfect trip for him, but he won quite easily here. He was best. Rainbows and Racing Stable LLC winning owner, Tom Morley, Manny Franco. Wins drawing away, like with convin conviction, convincing win. Yeah, no, no, he was he was best, good good trip or not. I mean, just because you got a good trip and win doesn't mean you weren't best. He was best. Milton the Monster, 1080 in the eighth of nine. What's the story quickly, Andy, with the pick six? Everyone is covered uh, for six of six, except the eight Prince of Joy, who's almost 5,000, 4,700 for five of six. But once again, the whole pool has to be distributed, being that we canceled yesterday and we had that carryover on New Year's Eve. So that's the story with the pick six. As for Game of Silks, uh, Richie's about to open his second and final envelope on the afternoon. He had that really nice gun runner earlier in the show. Richie? Yeah, I, I just got, that one's going to be tough to top. I don't think I can, but let's see. I got it here. All right, I got a distorted humor filly. Really strong female family. Out of Lady Gotcha, who this is her first registered foal. Uh, the second dam produced Gotcha Gold, American Freedom. So this horses we're familiar with, a lot of black type. When we talk about these pedigree pages, guys, the black type denotes that these families have been successful in the bigger races, the stakes races. So you want to see as much of that black type, that big, bold type as possible on the pedigree page. And even though she only brought $17,000, she certainly has a pedigree that feels like it could uh, turn into something better. Love distorted humor. I love the one he used to race. He was a really good horse. Elliot Walden, Adam. Tire of... Funny side, 03 Derby Preakness winner. If you bumped into somebody and said, we saw the show and they were talking about this game of silks, what's it all about? What would be the easiest way to explain this to a viewer, what it's all about moving forward? It's actual, you, you actually participate in the ownership of the horses in the sense that you buy one of these NFTs and you will get 1% of the horse's earnings. You participate if they become stallions, if they become broodmares. So... <clears throat> you actually can feel a little bit of what it's like to own a horse and obviously a bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes you come up with, as we've said, so Kansas squid, <laughs> but we've also come up with some pretty good ones as well as there are good horses out there. There is an NFT for every single foal that's been born. I think it's an extremely clever idea and I think it's a very fun way for somebody to get involved in ownership. And I know there have been a number of ways that people have liked to get involved. This is one where you're gonna participate, you know, the one Richie got with $325,000. I actually asked Chad Brown, the other horse, Chad Weatherworth, he, he he actually thought he may have to pay more for that filly hey. um, when she sold. So, you know, I mean, obviously it's too hard to know, early to know. You know, sometimes they're bad in the bar, the, the, the far at this point and they get good and vice versa. More often they're good right now and they end up not. But I know he's excited by it and you have to be excited by the gun runners. And uh, listen, there's somebody uh, somewhere out there is the Kentucky Derby winner is the 2024 Kentucky Derby winner, as well as some other very big races. Now you get the, the data, NFT likeness of a racehorse, uh, turning horses into a digital asset where the metaverse meets horse racing ownership game of Silks. For more information, visit silks.io. Andy will be opening envelopes throughout the course of the broadcast, and we have one left, winding down the New Year's Day program from Aqueduct with the pick six, race number nine, horses in the paddock, post time, 10 minutes.
closely associated with Todd Pletcher, and as for as long as I've known Todd, he's as high on Constitution as any other stallion that I can remember. It's resulted in us buying five Constitutions here at this sale for Mike Rapoli and Vinnie Viola, and then Mike himself. He loves being able to train them. Todd always thought that that horse was uber talented, um, and we're seeing him pass that on to his progeny. Who are you betting on? How about an app created specifically for horse racing? Naira Bets. We specialize in thundering hooves, fist pumping, and boosting your bankroll with robust weekly promotions and offer betting tips from actual horse racing experts. Bet all day and night, nationwide. Get the action and thrill of horse racing with Naira Bats. Sire Sensation Gunrunner is the sire of six first crop grade one winners. God I, and he's gonna win the Hope Bowl. Echo Zulu wins the Breeders' Cup Jubilee Phillies, and Cyberknife has won the Hasbro. Society is gonna win the Cotillion and Tata. They win the Vampires Pennsylvania Derby. Early voting comes inside and wins it. He wins the Breeders' Cup. Horse of the Year, Gunrunner, standing at three chimneys. Tampa Bay Downs has a rich thoroughbred horse racing history in Florida dating back to 1926. Celebrities such as Babe Ruth, Jack Dempsey, and John Ringling all attended opening day. In 1981, Hall of Fame jockey Julie Crone won her first career race here, and in 2007, we saw Street Sense win the Tampa Bay Derby and go on later that year to win the Kentucky Derby. Featuring full fields, great turf racing, and a 15% takeout on our pick five, Tampa Bay Downs has live racing every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back. You're watching America's Day at the Races, brought to you in part by Naira Betts. Any track, including Oakland Park, anywhere, anytime, Naira Betts. Get started at NairaBets.com today. UBS Arena, Belmont Park. We're here at Aqueduct. Why are we showing that? Eight miles away. I haven't been there yet. No, not yet. I've been to Belmont. <laughs> really? Haven't been to the... I've been there too. Arena. <laughs> just yet. <laughs> uh, your up. your next uh, superstar. I can I can I can feel it. Oh, we're opening. I can it? feel I'm it. Yeah, it yeah, oh. should, yeah. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Look, the Academy Awards here with the envelope. I've got. And the winner is. I've got an audible. I've got a uh, seventy thousand dollar audible sold in October at Fazek Tipton. Audible. Oh, the dam was a, the dam was diamonds and rust. No, she was unraced, but not a bad uh, second family war story. The the the. The dam is a half to war story, who of course was very good going long. This one sold for seventy thousand, so perhaps this one can go a little bit longer. Do we know as this one, guys? Mm. By any chance? War uh, story run like sixty-five times in a lot of uh, feels like a lot. Great, yeah. Yeah. Handicap My man, or, yeah. uh, the Luch. The Luch, Luch had a Luch Luch story. Had yeah, yeah, yeah. Luch never gun shy. No, no, he, never gun shy. Um, but yeah, no, audible. I think it's. I don't know if it's my second Audible. I feel like one of my first might have been an Audible. There was an Audible. There was I can't an audible. remember if it was yours. It was it me? Was yeah, you. I think my second one was an Audible. So now I have two Audibles. Well, it was pretty good horse. Thanks for paying attention. Well, I got so excited by the Into Mischief for 1.35. Well, completely that I understandable. Forgetting. Completely understandable. I'm excited about Richie's today. I'm excited about all of them. I think it's all fun as a team. You know, we were talking about it. If, if it turns out that, you know, one or two of these horses are okay, I think it'll be really exciting for 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 um, it'll be really exciting for just as a group, you mm -hmm. know, because we're all in this together, and you know the money. Nobody's making any money on this. We're, charities will make money. We make money. Um, we will donate to, to horse-related charities, and I think it'll be fun to follow it along. And and I really I don't feel as though I'm shilling with this show, with this thing. I think like this is not, a very the, the, very the cool idea. The enthusiasm is not manufactured. Yeah, this is a it, really this is cool really idea. This is really exciting. This has a fantasy feel to it. If you're a fantasy football player, fantasy horse race in the fantasy stable, this is something you could gravitate towards. In fact, if Richie's listening uh, in the break, Andy was telling me, I don't know if you could hear it, Richie, that Andy might be open to a trade. Might be open to a trade. Your gun runner for his into mischief. I would certainly trade 50-50. But we're all as a team together, so I don't really know that. But I, we can discuss that. But I, I love the fact that the horse that Richie got today is 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 owned by by somebody I'm friends with. So that kind of I can't wait in six weeks when this is all cutthroat and gets ugly and now. <laughs> we shockingly all get along around here. It's you that nobody <laughs> likes. When you're not here, there's no animosity. You come in here and Some, things start to get ugly. Sometimes the paranoid really is being followed. Sometimes. Yes. 
Cash in the flash, Manny Franco at 5-1. to one. Looking to go back-to-back back is Franco. Yeah, I wouldn't like this horse on paper, but the way Rob Atchison's barn is going, I'm not leaving his horses out. But this horse's dirt form is atrocious. Saw misbehaved, once purchased for $875,000. Giamonte, uh, not a finisher, that's been the issue? Um, yeah, Giamonte is a turf horse anyway. This horse can't stand up on the dirt. Uh, ghostly Why is he Prince, the one victory, December 17th, 2020. Drops down a little bit, but I thought would have to improve. Prince of Joy needs to step it up. Yeah, was a big upset winner in the show last year. Blew up a pick six. Mailman's a flyer. Uh, Maryland bred. Aqueduct debut. I cannot leave out Norm Cash's horses. Um, uh, I think he's, he's another guy whose horses they're really running here. Five to one currently. BC Glory Days. Uh, Matty Oliver uh, rode him to a second place finish at 19 to one last time. Ran off on Matty last time and finished second. She had one yesterday. Fenway had run off the time before that. Cut back and came back for her second win. Um, really did run well last time. Bourbon's Hope, eight to one on the morning line. Owned and trained Linda Rice, current five to two favorite. And my friend uh, who makes the morning line is filling in for David Aragona. I think he's gonna be really happy that that run is over. And Dave <laughs> will be back on Thursday as this one, not surprisingly, my top choice, the 11 Bourbon's Hope. Uh, is the favorite. And I think Bourbon's Hope last time was running against much too tough a field going long. Two back had gotten pressed very hard and ran a winning race. I think with the outside stalking position, I believe Bourbon's Hope is the worst to beat. But at five to two, I'm not telling you anything that a lot of people don't seem to know. Now, Richie, you heard Andy say, like, hey, we're all in this together. We're all in the same team. Whatever. <laughs> Are you open to a potential negotiation, a swap maybe if he's into it? Part of them. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with uh, this draft pick. I, I'm feeling pretty comfortable here. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to be rooting with you, Richie, so that's fine. Yeah, no, listen, I, I'm with you. I think this is great. We're all going to have a blast with a yep. lot of fun. Um, I, you know, just the fact, listen, Seth Claremont's very sharp. And the fact that they went to 325 for this Philly, and it, you know, it sounds like Chad was very happy to get her for that price. You know, he's bought a lot of good horses for far less money. So this Philly must have been a standout from uh, a physical uh, perspective, and obviously she's got a pedigree to match. So, um, you know, as as much as I was a little bit down in the the mouth about some of my other draft picks, I'm really really excited about this one, and it's just fun, guys. We're we're gonna have a good time with this, and it lives, gives us something to look forward to throughout the year. And I hope a lot of people jump on board. I I, I really got to tell you, when I it was the reveal. It made me excited. And I'm a guy who's been in the game since I'm 14 years old. So <laughs> it's nice to know you can still get excited about this stuff. And let's get excited about this last race here. Uh, Let's we'll start with the three cash and uh, is it cash and a flash. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, cash and a flash. A um, little verbal sparring going on between Rob Atris and Oscar Barrera, who's got a horse that showed high speed last time. And basically, Rob's saying, I'm going. You, if you want to go, we, you may win the battle, but you're not going to win the war. I'm going. So he threw down the gauntlet, but uh, he looks good from a physical perspective. I just thought it was kind of interesting that you get a little uh, trainer smack uh, talking going on there as well. Horse that was outstanding in the paddock at a big price and continued to look fabulous on the racetrack as the five misbehaved. This horse, man, if, if, if it was a beauty contest, and we know it's not, he, I would have given him the uh, the blue ribbon. I mean, he was imposing, strong, rich coat, very, very enthusiastic in his warm. Love what I saw from him. The 10 BC Glory Days, who showed that high speed last time, uh, trained by Oscar Barrera. You get Matty over, 10-pound break in the weights, well drawn outside. And even if Cash in a Flash goes, he gets just to kind of gallop outside, get into the race the right way. And, uh, you know, if Cash in a Flash isn't good and doesn't handle the dirt, then maybe he can assume the lead somewhere around the far turn. He'll be my top selection, guys. I, I like the break in the weights for the horse that ran extremely well last time at the distance and the 11 bourbons hope as your favorite really caught my eye on the racetrack not as much in the paddock was a little bit nondescript but in the warm-up uh certainly really kind of war i warmed up to him as the favorite and he, he looks terrific for trainer linda rice a strong contention towards the outside bourbons hope who is the favorite five to two richie touching on bc glory days uh, let's uh, revisit his most recent. This was uh, December 9th, right here, same level. BC Glory Days at, at 19 to 1. Look at that big cushion he's built. And Lucky Brody at 27 to 1, chasing. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you, you got to be excited home, if you right? bet the horse, but this horse went a little bit on the quick side early, and that eventually took a toll. And eventually just sort of uh, fell Where's apart the in late stages. Well, didn't come soon enough, but did run well. It's the fast race he ran, and it showed being aggressive. And his outside post probably going to be stalking cash in a flash, but he runs like he did last time, and I think you're going to see him up front. 
We'll see if he can get it done. He doesn't have his consistency. I prefer the horse on the outside, but at this price, I'm not exactly excited. It's the same level, similar competition. BC Glory Days was 19 to 1 on that afternoon. Is, is 9 to 2 too short? No, I think it's probably around what he belongs at. I don't, you know. I, I thought the race was, a, was, was, was somewhere between the 3, 9, 10, and 11. The 3 has no real form. With the 3, you're just going on the fact that Rob Atchison's horses have been mm -hmm. running extremely well lately, and you're doing that. But that's not what I like to do. I mostly played 11, 9. It was a big story, I think, in New York this year. Uh, Andy, the, the year that trainer Rob Atris is is coming off of in 2022. Well, he's been having good years for a few years since he came here. He was an ex-assistant to Robertino Diodoro. And like a lot of trainers, he can get very hot. And his horses will run extremely well in periods of time. And it seems like we're in one. Now, I don't know what you're supposed to like about this horse because he hasn't ever run well in the dirt. His best race was a sloppy track race, which is borderline good enough to win here. But the way the horses are running, including a horse yesterday that I just didn't think made a lot of sense on paper and improved dramatically. She was somewhat of a mid to high 50 buyer horse and won easily with a 71 buyer yesterday. Um, you know, maybe this horse can step forward. He does have speed. Post time, ninth and final New Year's Day. Here's Chris Griffin. And they're off. Speed to the outside from BC Glory Days. In between horses, there comes Giromani is in the early mix, and there's Cash in a Flash in the blue silks. Cash in a Flash is now ahead in front. Bourbon's Hope is going to be up with the early pace as they get set to come out of the chute. In between horses, there is Giromani. That's the leading trio. In behind them comes the orange cap of Prince of Joy. Then comes a tight hold here with Misbehaved as in between horses with Astral Weeks. They move forward from fifth and sixth. Out in the center of the racetrack, BC Glory Days is now mid-pack. Here's the move from Ghostly Prince is out in the center of the racetrack, but is now challenging for that fourth spot. Towards the tail end of the field, Mailman's a flyer, and the trailer is Lucky Brody. 22.98 for that opening quarter mile. Just getting squeezed out of there was Giramani. Got shuffled back towards the tail end of the field. That's Giramani tracking in second. Cash in a Flash has got the lead. They work into the far turn. It's Cash in a Flash. Giramani in second. Then comes BC Glory Days Ghostly Prince. In behind them comes Misbehaved. And here comes the rally from Bourbon's Hope. Bourbon's Hope was the one that got shuffled back. Is now in the fifth position but has some ground to make up. That one's followed by Prince of Joy. Then comes Mailman's a Flyer. Lucky Brody and the trailer Astral weeks 46 seconds flat for that half mile time they've got a quarter mile left to go they reach the top of the stretch and ghostly prince is ranging up on the outside here's ghostly prince prince of joy is rolling down the center of the racetrack with a lot of momentum as well here comes prince of joy to ghostly prince for a final furlong Prince of Joy has taken the lead. Bourbon's Hope had that trouble, is running up on the outside. Mailman's a flyer is launching a big rally from the back. But inside the final 16th, Prince of Joy is almost there. Prince of Joy. Jackie Davis, they get the score. Mailman's a flyer. Then comes a photo. Ghostly Prince is in a photo there with Bourbon's Hope. And one minute, 39.3. Three seconds. If not, for, if not for the mandatory payout, that would have triggered a, another pick six carryover. Prince of Joy at a massive price, 32 to 1. Jackie Davis in a nightcap New Year's Day shocker. Somebody will redboard this and say, well, a big win here in the slot. <laughs> and my answer will be in that race would have gotten her about sixth in this race, maybe seventh. Uh, I don't know what to say. I don't. Sometimes there are inexplicable results. I don't think this was one of those necessarily bad fields, bad horses. I don't know what to say sometimes in this game there are horses that just make you shrug your shoulders uh, obviously the 11 was very unlucky the premature move uh, uh, by the rider of the number seven ghostly prince kind of squeezed the 11 out of the race and it got Jose Lascano into a jackpot not saying he would have won or not finished on in fourth um, but he had real trouble in here mailman flyer did the late run but I don't know what to say you had this horse, I tip my cap to you. I always love to see Jackie Davis do well, but there's absolutely no way you can make this horse on paper. Oh, you said something earlier about manufacturing opinions yep. and how it's not genuine. If you're trying to put together a reason and Monday morning quarterback this one, you're manufacturing an opinion in terms of why and how Prince of Joy just won that last race. And this is a uh, training double for Richard yeah. Legal, who won earlier on a horse that I had liked, and Jonathan liked as well, Russell. So a training, training double for Richard E. Legal, something that there's not a huge chance you'll ever hear on America's Day at the Races again. Paul and Gary, if it sounds like we're blindsided, it's because we are. 
Yeah, but I mean, listen, prices all day at uh, Aqueduct. If you had the early pick five here at Oaklawn, it was $4,300, so not that bad. Uh, in the late pick five already started. We're on to race number um, seven here, Gary, the penultimate race, obviously, to the Smarty Jones. And we were talking off, listen, this looks like the public has it right between the four, five, and ten. Sue Ellen, Michigan. For Matt Scher, off the claim, was really good last time out. Yeah, and I, I like what I saw when she came on the racetrack. She was my pick on form, and she was my pick of looks when she came out. I love the looks of the four horse as well. Can't believe it for Jimmy DeVito, Tyler Bays, uh, coming off of a muddy race here December 9th. Uh, just faded early. Uh, he's going to have some heat up, up front along with him. So he's going to be up against it. But uh, Rockstar Park, and I know you're liking Rockstar Parking a little bit. Yeah, I like the 10 a tiny bit. You when you get back to the four, you make a good point. Can Sue Allen, Michigan, is the four going to show more speed? Can't believe it with the blinkers on, and that could cause somewhat of a speed duel a tiny bit. Yeah, and the thing I noticed with uh, Rockstar Parking is she went by uh, really on her toes, maybe a little over aggressive. Sometimes they'll uh, cool out on you a little bit in the post parade, but really on her toes when she came by us here. And that's the 10 horse. Yeah, guys, we're not seeing it much different in here. Gary and I have this race. He likes, I'm 10-5, I'm and you're 5-10, five, 5-4, five, somewhere in that area? 5-4. Five, 5-4, four. Five, four, we're 10-5-4 to get out of this race and maybe get yourself to a, a late pick three here with the Smarty Jones coming up next, Lafitte. Smarty Jones with the three-year-olds, race eight. Reach post time, race seven. And while we had the mandatory payout in the pick six at Aqueduct, we do have a pick five carryover. For next week, Andy. $189,000 late pick five carryover into next Thursday. I've done the work That'll already. Work. Get to work on that card. Actually, I thought there were some interesting horses in that card. So $189,000 carryover. Don't see too many of those. I like the four can't believe it over the 10 rock star parking in this race. They're my two. I didn't have a Similar to uh, so it, Gary and Paul? I was too caught up in the pick five to be worried. I, I don't love Sue Ellen Michigan in this race. Why? I just preferred the other one, so that they were a little bit better. Sue Ellen, Michigan, her most recent effort. First start for Matt Shearer, said Churchill Downs. Flashed her speed, broke sharp, made the lead, and they couldn't catch her in the stretch, Andy. Yeah, this is a horse that was originally owned by Al Gold, of course, who owns uh, Cyberknife. Cyberknife. Won her debut impressively. Uh, named after the character from Seinfeld, saying he couldn't use the actual name, so on Mishki, they had to use a different name. I, didn't know I don't really understand from. that because I've seen other names like that, random <laughs> made up names, you know what I mean? From TV shows, but that was why Al changed it, the name. You mentioned Al Gold, another really a story you could gravitate towards. His success with Cyberknife, how long Al Gold had been in the game, you know, growing up in the shadow of. Monmouth Park and winning Monmouth's biggest race, uh, the Haskell with Cyberknife and what a three-year-old campaign he had. Uh, listen, spending a lot of money in this game on horses is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that you're going to have success as an owner. And uh, we've seen repeatedly a lot of horses that have sold relatively cheaply, that have done very well in our big races. You think about this year with, with, with Rich Strike. Um, so just because you spend a lot and you buy expensive horses doesn't mean it pans out. And uh, Al's certainly been in the game a long time, and he's got a very good one. Cyberknife, who apparently, I guess, is making his last career start in the Pegasus. <sighs> it's disappointing. Yeah, I, it is disappointing. A lot of Listen, I am not going to knock an owner, and, we're, and you're not, and neither no, of us are suggesting. No, no, no. You, know, you put a lot of money in the game, and they come to you and offer you a lot of money to retire your horse. And remember something while people sit at home on their computers and they criticize people on Twitter. They put the money back in the game, and that's what sustains the game. So it's not as though they're pocketing it or running it off. They're, these are people that are supporting the game. And unless you're an owner and understand that situation, Al Gold would like to keep running Cyberknife, but he's also going to be happy running the 15 horses he's going to buy because he was able to syndicate them, maybe even more. Financially, does it make sense? As selfish fan, yeah, of course we want to see him. We want to see him until they're six years old. Somebody tells you your car in the parking lot is worth $10 million. You're not going to drive it home. You've... No matter how much money you have, you have to at least, to a certain extent, look at the economics of the game. And there are times you've got to take the money off the table. Um, there are times you wish you hadn't and you could have run longer. There are certainly times, though, that horses have been sold for a lot of money and turned out to be the, very much the right move for the owner. That's why we have, you know, when we do have the opportunity, for example, Kirk and Jody Robeson keeping Jackie's Warrior in training, we, we had him for one 
more year when so often is the case he would have been retired. I, that's one of the things I felt is so bad about with Epicenter. I think there's a good chance we would have seen sure. him run as a four-year-old. And obviously you're upset if any horse gets hurt, even at the lowest level. But for a horse like that, seeing him run as a four-year-old, a great disappointment, I'm sure, to the connections, but also, I think, to racing fans. Getting ready for this seventh race, late pick three, Oaklawn. Just a reminder that pick five at carryover for Thursday races four through eight, Aqueduct, hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars. And he's doing the work as no, no, speak. I'm finished with that card. Oh, you're this done with that. Friday. Oh, you're on the what? The Sunday card by now? Friday. I'd, I'd be on Sunday if we drill it. But uh, <laughs> I finished. I finished the Thursday, the Thursday card on New Year's Eve because I have such an exciting life. <laughs> at the gate for the seventh, two to one currently. Sue Ellen Mishkin. Big offer with the call. It's post time for the seventh on the undercard of the Smarty Jones New Year's Day at Oaklawn. Last to load, Rockstar Parking. They're at the post. They're off. Can't believe it broke very well for Tyler Bays and goes to the front from Sue Ellen Mishkin in second. Rockstar parking away in third, just outside of Can't Be Touched. Then Pipeline Girl, followed by La Morena, and a bad start has Black Cat Taps at the back of the pack. It's Can't Believe It, quickest past the half-mile pole, and she's opened up a smart two-and-a-half length lead over Rockstar Parking and Sue Ellen Mishkin. Then comes Can't Be Touched. Pipeline Girl is at the rail with four to make up. Then it's five lengths back to La Morena. Black Cat Taps is the trailer, and can't believe it is the leader, but now it's only three-quarters of a length as rock star parking and Walter De La Cruz come alongside. Can't believe it. Just a neck in front. Rock star parking has every chance to outfinish her. Those two square off at the top of the stretch. Rock star parking outside. Can't believe it inside. Rock star parking is now a neck in front. Can't believe it. Trying to battle back from the inside. Three back to Sue Ellen Mishkin. Rock star parking is now clear. She's got a length and a half on Can't Believe It in second. Then Sue Sue Ellen Mishkin, rock star parking, can't believe it, now shifts to the outside, but it's rock star parking in front. Rock star parking, one by three, can't believe it was second. Sue Ellen Mishkin, third, Black Cat Taps, finished fourth. Rock star parking, accelerating late, fifth lifetime win, three of those at Oaklawn with Walter De La Cruz in the seventh race at Oaklawn Park. And the right move getting away from the synthetics, this was sort of ran some of the slower races uh, she had run recently on synthetic goes back to Oakland where as you said she had that success and she and can't believe it the two I thought were the two they end up running one two in here Sue Ellen Mishkin a did you box that? Leader. I did not bet I was too busy dealing with the carryover <laughs> it's okay they're two to one or five to two I'm not running to bet those it's... Rockstar parking accelerating late the upstart mayor at Oakland results coming up and then we'll have the Smarty Jones three-year-olds, newly turned three-year-olds, first step towards the Arkansas Derby. But first, uh, we're rejoined by Paula Duca at Oaklawn. Polly, it is your turn. Game of silks. The unveiling, the opening of your envelope and your horse. I, Perhaps I, another. I feel, I feel like this isn't fair to me. Like, you guys are opening up the envelope for, like, the Oscars or something. You know what I mean? It's exactly like that. What do you got? <laughs> It's exactly like that. Ooh, we got a St. Patrick's Day? Is that the full brother to American Pharaoh? It is. is it, good call, Paul. Yeah, I would not have call. gotten that. I would not have gotten that. Yeah, it's a horse that ran over in Europe. Oh, obviously a new sire that's brought over here. I kind of like this. I know this horse sold for kind of cheap at the sale at around 9,500, 10,000, somewhere in that area. But you know what? Sometimes new sires can uh, can surprise you every once in a while. Of course, looks like it's got some turf pedigree on the bottom side, so you never know. I mean, listen, I, I've been fortunate. I got a nice little Munnings, a nice midshipman, and a Canthero. So I've had three nice little horses. And this one I want to say is, a, am I mistaken? A, ooh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> oh, this one's a Florida bred, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. And probably the fourth dam, it's your line. Come on, let's dance. So, you know, you got that going. Oh, that you. is... Th th that is, that is true, Andy. You've seen me pull shapes before on the dance floor. <laughs> Polly, what are your thoughts this concept as a whole? What are, your, what, what are your thoughts as it's getting started and starting to gather some momentum? I uh, mean, you mean the... Sorry, the feet. I didn't catch what you said. What game, you of, game of silks in general. 
Oh, I love it. I love it. I think it's just absolutely just an awesome concept. I mean, getting getting these golden cars and emails. Listen, I wake up every day thinking, and now I've got all these horses like jotted down. And it's going to be really cool to follow their careers. It really is. And where they go and where they race. And um, it's really a website you need to go check out. I, I Like Andy said, it, it's a complete, you know, a, a, conglomerate of all of us with all these horses we're going to be rooting for each other's horses well you know the dream would be one of these horses make it to the kentucky oaks or the kentucky derby and you also got some nice little new york breads and new york races so i mean the concept is amazing and i couldn't be more proud or excited to be part of it really Paulie, impressed Lafitte, came up. lafitte's rooting against us i just want you to be clear Polly. we're rooting together okay <laughs> lafitte hopes we all our horses do poorly it's i not, mean it's I just, just his, I, I the kind of person be, he is especially if you would like a little more combative that's all. <laughs> when did you when did you two smoke the peace pipe? Paul and I are friends. I like <laughs> you and I. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm gonna instigate it's, it's this as much Tom as I Amos possibly that I don't can. Like. Try to get clear <laughs> on that. Well, well established. Uh, Silks.io. You need to check it out. Uh, tremendous uh, 3D interactive website. Game of Silks. Uh, still a couple more envelopes to open up before the end of the broadcast. We still have the Smarty Jones and trainer Steve Asmussen. Derby Prep at Oaklawn, uh, you know he's going to be involved, uh, represented by two in the Smarty Jones. Brad Cox will counter with two of his own, two of the best in the business with sights set on the Smarty Jones. That's next at Oaklawn Park. Warfront. On the racetrack, his accomplishments included this victory in the Vanderbilt at Saratoga. It will be Warfront to win it by two and a half lengths. Now this son of Danzig ranks among the world's elite sires. With over 100 stakes winners, Warfront's progeny includes some of the world's most talented runners, both at home and abroad. Ranked number one by percentage of lifetime stakes winners, graded stakes winners, and grade one winners. Warfront, standing at Claiborne Farm. Sun setting in South Ozone Park, New York. Welcome back. Happy New Year. America's Day at the Race is brought to you in part by Naira Betts. But any track, including Oaklawn, anywhere, anytime with Naira Betts. Get started at NairaBets.com today. All smiles, Jackie Davis. You can fire away at that pick five on Thursday on your Naira Betts account with a carryover, 189,000 plus going in. Yeah, no, that is exciting. Um, that we really, we love those carryovers. I mean, and I've actually looked at the card. If we have some time, we'll I'll go through some of the races Absolutely. on the show. Absolutely. Um, went through that card and finished it up last night. Actually, um, have some ideas in there. Looks like an interesting sequence. But uh, congrats to Jackie. She's done it before. We saw her win with a lot of long shots here at different times last year, and uh, got it done here. An improbable winner, but congrats it wasn't to her like a blanket finish and five of them across no. the track and by a no actually one clear. This was a memorable day for trainer Richard E. Legal. Two wins on this great. Two wins on the afternoon. Prince of Joy, 66 even over Mailman's a flyer.
Ghostly Prince 897. And the pick six, the mandatory payout, Andy. Five of six paid 47 almost $4,800. So what's the parlay in that sequence? We're looking at about $18 times about 20, let's say, times 15, so we're 1,800 times five, about 10,000. So it's a parlay of over $300,000, about three and a quarter. Don't take this the wrong way, but yep. when you do that, I feel like I'm watching Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. Don't take this the wrong way, like it's, it's just it's because impressive. I'm smarter than you are. It's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> savant is the word that comes it's to not, mind. It's not. It's just math. It's just math. If you had done it as long as I had, you'd have no problem doing it. It's multiplying numbers. It's not that hard. You just don't it's do impressive. it. It's impressive. Thank you. It's I don't think it is. It's quickly you do it. It is impressive. An attempt at a compliment. Multiplying an attempt, 12 and an 5 is not really difficult, <laughs> but thank you for thinking that stuff. Rockstar Parking. Oaklawn 760 over Can't Believe It and Sue Ellen Mishkin. Up next is the Smarty Jones three-year-olds, newly turned three-year-olds. Uh, if you want, we have a few moments now to go ahead and walk well, through that sequence. You can't do it while I'm on camera because it's about 10 feet from it me. Is. So well, if you focus on the feet for about five seconds let's there, I'll go camera. grab my PPs. And, and then uh, you can get up. Or we, we can go to Tampa. We could go to Tampa. Race number nine. Take a look at the field from Tampa. And then... Take your time, guys. That late pick five. I like the three in the last attempt. Right, Thursday. He likes the three. Dorothy's the boss at five to one. Tampa Bay Downs, race number nine, off the turf on the main track. They were off the turf yesterday, hence all the defections. All right, one. now we got Aqueduct. Now you got Aqueduct? We got Aqueduct. Okay, so what are we looking at? Uh, it's an eight race card, so it starts in race number four. Mm -hmm. Man, you um, are good at math. Race number four. Yeah. Race number four <laughs> is a mess. Okay, the favorites probably gonna be the ten, second, and Reed. Um, I'm taking a flyer with the six, Basic Truth. I'm looking at five, six, and ten as my horses. I like the one in Neho in race five. The seven, Total Impact, probably the favorite. They look like the two. Um, uh, the entry is going to be heavily favored in race six. I would love the 1A if he was, he was alone, but he's going to be with the favorite, so I've gone a little off the radar with Son of an X. It's a horse I'm interested in for Randy Persaud. Seventh race, a little off the, off the reservation with the four Corey, but there's a few contenders in there. And closing it out, it's a wild race. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure. I got a couple of weirdos, the three and five, Franny Lou, and try it again are my bombs to get you started. They're horses I'll use, but... Take a look. It's a weird sequence, but there could be some fun in there. Some fireworks. Likes a couple of weirdos in a weird sequence. Carryover pick five on Thursday. Uh, we are going to step aside on Fox Sports 2, Michigan, Maryland, college basketball. But we will be back for the Smarty Jones from Oakland. Molly Moon, Jose Bautista at a gate nine, just waiting on Waterwitch, Daniel Centeno to the outside. Waterwitch coming forward. They're in the gate. And the race is on. Barbara got away in good order and goes out to the front at once. Cindy Song going to try to stay with that one toward the inside. And Bali Moon up from the outside joins them as those three across the track as they run to that first turn. It is Barbara just in front. Bali Moon up from the outside. Cindy Song cuts the corner. Those three, the top three by the 7 eighths pole. Then comes Dorothy's the boss. Right to that one's outside is Glitter Bay. Races in fifth. It's already about six or seven more back to Waterwitch who's a distant last, about 10 lengths off the lead with six furlongs left to go. Up on the front end, Cindy Song takes advantage of that inside draw. And goes to the front. Cindy Song now ahead in front of Barbara. Just in behind them comes Bali Moon. After that comes Dorothy's the boss in the teal and pink colors who's down toward the inside fourth. Glitter Bay right to her outside is fifth. And it's still six or seven more then. Back to Water Witch who trails. They have a half mile left to go in the finale. Cindy Song is the leader. Cindy Song and Richard Braccio by the half mile pole in front by a length. The opening half at 48 and one fifth seconds. Now the lead's a length and a half. 
Barbara in the second position. A length and a half more after that. Back to Dorothy's the boss who creeps into contention from third. Bolly Moon pushed along in fourth. Still four lengths behind. After that comes Glitter Bay. Water Witch is starting to close in. Is going to take the wide route, but is drawn to within five and a half of the lead. Cindy Song, the leader. Dorothy's the boss. Going to take a crack at her at the quarter pole, though. Right to there outside is Barbara. Bolly Moon going to be four deep. Water Witch continues to progress. The gray is actually going down toward the inside now and is still four lengths behind. Cindy Song comes to the furlong pole. Water Witch has an opening. Dorothy's boss, the boss right down the outside. A final 16th now. Cindy Song looking for that last 150 yards. Water Witch between horses. Dorothy's the boss on the outside. It's still Cindy Song there. Cindy Song, Water Witch with one final surge. Cindy Song holding on. Water Witch was second. Dorothy's the boss. Third, fourth. Went to Bali Moon. Cindy Song holds on in this ninth race at Tampa Bay Downs. A second Lifetime victory, opened up that big lead and able to get home in time. They were able to close I, the gap. I didn't know which one of her dirt races I liked more, the 11 buyer or the negative zero buyer. Probably the 11. Not one I would add. I was a fan of her sire, first dude. So was I. Massive. Ooh, if he had won the Preakness. Huh, if he had won the Preakness. I you have won the Preakness? That. Yeah, but I had the exacta. It was, uh, it was the Bob Baffert looking at Lucky. Looking at Lucky. First dude. Uh, Jackson Bend. It was like a four third, horse photo. Yep. First fourth. dude. First dude was second. Jackson Bend was mm -hmm. third. Well, it would be about three quarters of the line. Would have been the other. So there about four of them. Yeah, there was somebody the, the, close the, the, the Derby winner was spent. Who was the Derby winner? Yeah, I believe. Oh, was it Super Shackle Saver? Though, Super yeah. Saver? No. Uh, I think Super oh, Saver. Oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Super right. Saver. Hey, what a segue. Three year olds. Potentially on the Derby Trail, certainly on the trail to the Arkansas Derby. Featured event on this New Year's Day from Oaklawn Park. The Smarty Jones in honor of the 04 Arkansas Derby winner, Kentucky Derby Preakness winner, runner-up in the Belmont Stakes. 20 Kentucky Derby points available, 10 to the winner, and a quarter million dollar purse. Look at that, eight of them running a mile. Victory formation, six to five on the morning line. Odds on two to five in the early wagering. Two to five is a little bit low on this horse, no? Stretching out for the first time. I mean, that seems like is communication memo really that impossible here off the maiden win? Improved a lot in there. Ten days later, it's a little tough to buy that fig, but source ran a big number last time out, improving for Ken McPeak. They seem like I would think this all tightens players. up a little bit. Yeah. As we get closer, victory formation in his two starts. He had the easy debut win and life and death in that second career start. Where he and he he looked like he was spent at the top of the stretch. You do give him extra credit for digging and fighting and clawing, sure. but really, really had to work. But you give him less credit when the horse he beat was the heavy favorite in yesterday's stake there, six furlongs, and he came back and lost. Um, so I think that's a little bit of a knock on him. I did not look to see what kind of number that race got and to see if maybe the winner just ex improved a great deal. But I think that's a bit of a knock. He's a tapper, so you would think he gets better in more distance. I'm not against him by any stretch of the imagination, but I think at that price, He's a bit of an underlay in there. We talked about Brad Cox's numbers, 26% horses stretching out on the dirt, but 26% not good enough when you're betting two to five no. shots. So I think there's reasons to be a little skeptical with him, though he's the horse to be. Two to five currently. Uh, we'll have much more from Oaklawn. Paula Duca, Gary Stevens on site. The Smarty Jones coming up. Three-year-olds will be in the paddock. And leading up to post time for this Smarty Jones this afternoon from Oaklawn Park, the feature on New Year's Day. You're watching America's Day at the Races. Introducing a stallion as top class as they come. In 22 career starts, he won or placed in 12 graded stakes, competing in 15 grade ones, earning over $1.7 million. His undisputed speed is evidenced by seven 100 plus buyer speed figures, a three time grade one winner, Raging. Have to be a multi-millionaire to get into this game you can have a few thousand dollars and have fun with it but with the bonds you're actually going to win i've had the opportunity to win multiple races in fact this year won two times in one day which is almost unheard of to be able to do this is going to happen with them you will get into the winner's circle in saratoga you will walk that horse in and you will stand there look at the crowd and the bonds will take you there and get you into that winner's circle and it won't cost you a lot of money history 
remembers moments of extraordinary strength, skill, and determination. True greatness is forged by those who fulfill their destiny. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on every screen, every, screen, every day. Every With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. Are we having fun yet, Andy? I am having the best. Are you coming back to plan my vacations going forward? <laughs> End of the month, I think. Really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Good. No, if I, they I'll figure out that the more I'm here, the less you're here. <laughs> yeah, you'll, that, you'll be you a better, permanent employee very it. soon. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, that's a good point. What Maybe. are you wishing is in this uh, envelope? Oh, we're doing this now? Yeah. Oh. That was a good time. Is there like a, do we play music? Is there like a? We could cue the animation. Guys, are we? Oh, there we go. There it is. Game of Silks. Okay. The next reveal. Well, I got a tonalist, Philly, tonalist. She RNA'd for 15,000 and Fazic tipped it in October. Um, so we don't have anybody buying her. Let's see. I did love tonalist. Um, Tonalist was a cool horse. You know, he's not, yeah, he he's been a little disappointed to sire for a horse that he won a great one at a mile. He won the Jockey Club twice. He won the, the Breeders' Cup Classic. He did them all being trained by Christophe Clement. It's got some good New York bred blood going down. You got uh, some nice New York breds down in the fourth family. And heaven knows why, the third uh, family is Kentucky bred. So looking forward to this one. Um, it looks like the second foal. Uh, uh, this is their second foal. The first one placed in two starts was a midshipman. So keep an eye on this one. Uh, tonalist, Stormy Below. Not right. quite the 1.3 million into mischief, but I'm you're a Tonalist a, fan. You know what? It's okay. We're all excited. We're looking forward to finding out more about these horses. And listen, you're going to get some, you know, to, to get fortunate to get one that good. And we saw a terrific one for Richie, or at least an expensive one, and a gun runner. But a good horse can come from anywhere, as Richie likes to Robert say. Robert Evans' own tonalist, uh, the Belmont Stakes winner in 2014 with California Chrome bidding on a triple crown. What a ride, Joel Rosario. More information. Game of Silks, silks.io. And in just a few seconds, we are going to be rejoined by our Fox Sports 2 audience just in time. Because it's time for the feature at Oakland, the Smarty Jones. Coming up, three-year-olds again. Just take a deep breath and welcome back our viewers on Fox Sports 2. Welcome back to our viewers on Fox Sports 2. You're watching America's Day at the Races. Happy New Year. Alongside Andy Serling, I'm Lafitte Pinkai. The racing is through here at Aqueduct. The sun has set, but getting ready for the main event out at Oaklawn Park. Andy, next Saturday, we'll have three-year-olds here at Aqueduct with the Jerome. First step on road to the Wood Memorial at Oaklawn Park. It's the first step towards the Arkansas Derby. Like, what are you looking for from newly turned three-year-olds this early in the year? They've been three for a few hours. Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> You don't get carried away. You look to see if some of these horses can improve. Some of them will be stretching out. Our Jerome is a one-turn mile. This is a two-turn race, the Smarty Jones. And I think you're looking to see if these horses progress a little bit with distance, if they're horses that do progress as race horses. The chances that you're seeing the Derby winner, well, they're not strong, but Smarty Jones won what used to be run as our first stake, yep. Count Fleet, which was run the first weekend in January. He won it at, at Aqueduct going back a number of years. So. You have seen horses that do win those races early in the year, and we've seen some very good horses come out of Aqueduct. Early voting won our Withers, who end up winning the Preakness. Cloud Computing, a similar situation. We have seen good horses come out of the Aqueduct winter meet. You don't want to dismiss it, and obviously we've seen some good ones come out of Oakland in the past as well. You mentioned Smarty Jones, Curlin, more recent uh, Triple Crown winner, American Pharaoh. That clear path to the Triple Crown, Smarty Jones of Southwest, Rebel Arkansas Derby. Lots of money, lots of Kentucky Derby points that are offered at uh, Oaklawn Park, and it all starts today. Victory Formation, who is the current favorite, at uh, two to five. As we check back in with Paula Duca, standing by live at Oaklawn Park. 
With owner of Victory Formation, Frank Fletcher here. It's going to be in the Smarty Jones. Um, Frank, well known around here in Arkansas, and obviously you love to win at this track. Yeah, I really would. Uh, you know, I've got my partners uh, with Spendthrift Farms over in uh, Kentucky, and they're watching on TV today, so I want to say hello to them. But this is my home track, and uh, I've never been in the Smarty Jones. I've been in all the other major races over here. This is my first shot at this race. Well, I mean, the horses only run twice. Now going to go around two turns. What has the trainer told you? Well, when we first got him, he told me he was a two-turn horse, so we're going to see if he knows <laughs> anything about it. But, uh, you know, he ran great the first two times, but he has not gone this distance, so I think that's the key question today. Well, if you know Frank, he names a lot of his horses Rock, Rockette. Frank's Rockette became a millionaire yesterday. Uh, and what a mare she's turned out to be. And you were telling me that you were thinking about maybe going to the breeding shed, but she ran so well, you're going to keep on running her. Well, we thought we'd just ask her, do you want to be a mom or do you want to keep racing? <laughs> she won by 12 lengths, so I don't think she wants to be a mom. Well, that is probably true. Now, is if Victory Formation happen to have a little bit of a hiccup here would you tell brad that we should have named this horse Vic victory rocket or victory rock starts your guys' fault well i think victory formation is a great name <laughs> i really like it talk about frank's rocket a 105 buyer yesterday in that big win fast yeah and she's been doing it for a while one of the best female sprinters in the game for a few years and even when she had that run where she was finishing second so often she was doing it against such good horses and running fast races really neat horse technical difficulties there uh, from oaklawn park uh and i blame him i blame mitch levitas or frank director. fletcher co-owner with victory formation along with spendthrift a three hundred and forty thousand dollar colt he is undefeated to this point we'll see what he does today facing stakes company smarty jones in honor of the 04 kentucky derby winner when he put away lion hart and Stu elliott what a five weeks that was brilliant in the preakness and just came up short in the belmont stakes with that moment and that first saturday in may undefeated kentucky derby winner smarty jones
was just different. Something special, as Tom Durkin referenced, the first undefeated Kentucky Derby winner since Seattle slew Smarty Jones in the slop at Churchill Downs in 2004. I was always sorry it rained that day. Not obviously it worked for him, but a lot of horses just felt like they didn't show up, including Birdstone, who beat him in the in the tra in the uh, <clears throat> Belmont. His Preakness, the race after this, was man a tremendous, tremendous performance. Is one of the best performances I've ever seen, you know, live uh, in a, in a three-year-old classic race. First Preakness I've ever been to. I was a big Rock Hard Ten fan. And Tom Durkin says, Rock Hard 10, uncoiling that massive stride. And I'm watching Rock Hard 10, and I go back to look at where Smarty Jones should be. He wasn't there. <laughs> he was opening, he was in front by five. Yeah, I bet, I bet Rock Hard 10 in that race as well. And it's really unfortunate that they didn't race him again after the dirt, after the Belmont, they could have. Um, and it was a shame because he obviously a very talented horse and you would want to see him. And I, you know, you think about that incredible day in the rain in Saratoga when it, you know, at the end when Birdstone won the Travers and what it would have been to see the two of them look up again. But nonetheless, he was a horse that had an enormous, enormous following. And what it meant for Oaklawn to go through the Southwest and the Rebel Stakes and the Arkansas Derby, back when the Arkansas Derby was a grade two race, what it meant for him to go and take that path to the Kentucky Derby and win the Derby in the Preakness Stakes. Yeah, no question about it. Now, all the final preps should be grade twos because it's random. You know, last year's Wood was obviously the best prep. It, the winners of the Preakness and the Belmont were in it, and there's going to be a certain amount of randomness to it. And I don't believe that a prep for the final prep for the Kentucky Derby should be a grade one. They should all be grade twos, but obviously that helped their program. American Pharaoh going there as well. And because Oakland has become such a, a favored spot for Bob Baffert, who perennially has uh, top two-year-olds, or the top three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know what he's going to do this year because he's not allowed to run the Kentucky Derby again this year for the second year in a row. So will he have to give them up? And they're not going to get points unless he goes to different trainers. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. But still, you have to imagine he'll have some good horses and they'll be directed to Oakland. Steve Asmussen is represented with a pair in this Smarty Jones. Number three, communication memo at six to one. Also the long shot. How did he do that at 30 to one? Victory formation, two to five. Communication memo, it took him a, a, a while, Andy. Four starts to finally graduate, finally get that first win, but he is improving and, and won this race with authority. He ran into a monster in his first start. He lost to victory formation, sprinting in his second start. He took a big step forward from a speed figure standpoint in his third start, and then stretching out, ran the same kind of race. Bolt Doros had a very terrific year mm -hmm. as his first year as a sire. He was a very talented runner as well. And I think of his last race, you have to consider him a contender because the one thing he's done is win going longer. Now it is, for whatever it's worth, depending on how you feel about it, he won going one turn last time, and now he's going two turns. Is that saying, I don't really worry about it. And the one thing I would say is because he has speed and he can be forward, I don't think it's supposed to really matter. And a lot of times, forwardly placed horses will be better at two turns than they are at one if they can handle the distance. Frank Fletcher, yeah, he can't hide, can he? <laughs> Tall, imposing figure. There he is with Victory Formation co-owner. Spend Thrift Farm co-owned the $340,000 purchase victory formation. Brad Cox says he's not concerned about the stretch out. In fact, he's excited about victory formation and how he thinks he'll handle the added distance and no concerns about the outside post position. What do you think is the biggest obstacle for the still two to five favorite in the Smarty Jones? No, well, he's going to have to prove that he's effective going longer and going two turns and he can run his race. No, he's got a pedigree that says he should. He has an outside post, but he does have the speed to clear. And you have to imagine Flavian Pratt's going to look to be aggressive. One of the reasons he's as successful as he is, is he is an aggressive rider. And if he's able to clear, it will make his job that much easier. But still, from a betting perspective, you're talking about a two to five shot stretching out off a win at six furlongs where he beat a horse that disappointed as a heavy favorite in yesterday's stake. So those are some question marks. I'm not saying he's not the worst to beat. He is the worst to beat. But I think two to five is going a little bit overboard in this horse. It, he doesn't have that kind of edge. Who would you try to, who would you take a shot with then against him? Um, I think I would look at the three. I don't like the six. 
Um, the three and five would be the two that I'd be most inclined to want to use. The ones the public have, the second and third choice. Probably communications memo, because I like the fact that he's progressing for Steve Asperson. I like when I see his horses mm -hmm. improving, because they often keep improving. But I don't have a pro real problem with 10 days later. I think those are the two, and the public agrees. They are the two likeliest upsetters. We will hear from Ricardo Santana, communication memos jockey, with Gary Stevens out at Oaklawn Park. In fact, they're ready to go. Gary Stevens with Ricardo Santana writing communication memo in this Smarty Jones Stakes. Three, three, two, three, two, three, two, one. Ricardo, you're writing communication memo for the second time today. Third time, actually. You rode him sprinting at Keeneland first time out. He had three sprint races. You rode him first time out here going long. Uh, on December 16th. Nice win. Uh, tell me what you're looking for today and the difference between sprinting and running long that first time. Well, the horse is being on pro a lot, Gary. Um, he ran really good long last night here. He looked like he really liked the track here, Oakland. And uh, I'm really excited for him today. Let me ask you, we run the short stretch here, in other words, to the 16th pole instead of the normal finish line. And uh, what's your thoughts going in? And let me ask you one other question added on to that. Did he gallop out good after that mile race last time? Well, actually, he galloped out pretty strong. I only hit it, if I remember, was like two times, used to call it attention because he was looking a lot. And... Um, I have a lot of horse that day. I don't want to use it. I don't use it all. So I, I, I think it's going to be pretty tough today. Anticipate a good break and uh, laying close to the pace once again today. Yes, sir. That's the plan. Ricardo, good luck and uh, all the best. Thank you, Gary. Guys. Gary, thanks so much. Ricardo Santana, all the success he's had at Oakland over the years, several riding titles, and specifically for Steve Asmussen. And good to see Santana riding for Asmussen in a stakes race out at Oakland Park. Yeah, I mean, that's a story that I don't think any of us will ever really know that what really happened there. And Ricardo went through a, a slow slump, but uh, he rode a lot of horses for Steve. They had a lot of success together. But uh, he'll get back with him, and I think he'll do very well with his new agent, Jimmy Riccio. And I'm looking forward to seeing those two have a very big Oakland meet, as I believe they will. This is uh, Team Matoli communication memo Love for the Highland Broats, trained by Steve Asmussen, Ricardo Santana, one of the most talented talented sprinters we've seen over the last couple of decades. I think there's a very strong argument that he was as deserving for a horse of the year when he lost to Bricks and Mortar as Bricks and Mortar. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of Bricks and Mortar, but I, I could have easily voted for him. And I know that it wasn't close to the voting, but I, I thought he had a horse of the year campaign that year with his wins. The Breeders' the Cup Met sprint, Mile, the Met right? Mile, one of the races, one bad race, a dead rail at Saratoga, he won the Forgo. He, he was a tremendous race horse. I, I, I love Matoli. I'd, I'd love to see him go on and be a decent sire. And for the Highland Broats who own Communication Memo, own Matoli, Ricardo Santana aboard, currently 6-1, to one, the third choice in the wagering. Ten days later, does his best work late, 5-1, to one, the would-be second choice. Victory formation continues to reign as an odds-on favorite, 2-5. to five. Not that it matters, and I don't think you factor this into your handicapping, but he does have an unconventional way of traveling. He does wing up front quite a bit. Like, doesn't like, mean anything's wrong. It's just unconventional. It's funky mechanics. No, but, you know, I, 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 I can't help but think of the George Weaver horse that won yeah. the Carter and the Met Mile. It was so the super slot. talented, but it kept him off the racetrack a lot. Look, you win the Bluegrass? Yes, you won the Bluegrass. I can't name? believe I'm having a, you know, like my brain is freezing. We'll do the post parade and then we'll remember. Somebody it. will come up with it. Post parade for the Smarty Jones, CJ Storm. Ambitiously placed Indiana bread. Did improve last time out, but we'll have to take another big step forward. How did he do that? Jackie's warrior connection, Steve Asmussen, for the Robesons. He's stretching out for the first time, and he has been improving. Can he take another step forward? It's an awfully big price at almost 30. 29 to 1. to 1. Communication yeah. memo. Asmussen train Colts will break side by side. Seems to be coming around, and distance didn't seem to be a problem. Western Ghent, 40 to 1. Ran four times this summer at Saratoga. But he was part of my biggest score of the Saratoga meet. So I have a great affinity for him. Biggest score. Just didn't, how much? Didn't take much, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Western Ghent would be an absolute shot. Christian Torres, a couple of wins on the afternoon. Then 10 days later, Kenny McPeak, who saddled last year's Smarty Jones winner, Dash Attack. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, he, listen, he ran a good figure last time out. It did sort of mixed signals looking at some others in the race, but the, the, on the surface of the thing, it was a race fast enough to win here. Dennington also trained by McPeak. McPeak, four wins yesterday in a stake sweep. Yeah, I don't like the race he comes out of. I think the Ducky Jockey Club is extremely weak this year. Number seven, Angel of Empire, first of two for Brad Cox. He'd have to improve a lot. His two dirt races, both at Indiana Grand, but that's where Monoy Girls started her career. And victory formation, two to five, talented, and he is a fighter. But when you look at a horse that's two to five in a race like this, you sort of expect to see speed figures that are laying over the field. And frankly, he does not have that. I think he's supposed to be about four to five to even money. I think they're going overboard. Not saying he's not the likeliest winner, but I believe they're going overboard in this horse. Paul, Gary, what do you think? Two to five victory formation in terms of the wagering, strictly the one to beat in this Marty Jones. You know, I didn't think two to five, Gary. I thought maybe around four to five, especially a horse that's doing something for the first time going around two turns. I understand it's Brad Cox, Flaunt Drew. I mean, excuse me, Flavian Pratt flew in to ride, so that has a little bit to do with it as well. But I was thinking around four to five or so because He's doing something for the first time. Yeah, he's being bet uh, too short because of the names, the connections. Yeah. I agree. Looks great out there on the racetrack under attack. And you had asked me earlier what I thought about him stretching out yeah. to the distance today. Listen, I think it's going to play into his hands. Uh, benefit coming out of those sprint races. He's going to be tactical. Uh, he's going to get a good... Uh, a good position from that outside post position, I would think. And look, you get to make that early move. Yeah. And you can run horses off their feet into that turn, moving at the five six, or the seven sixteenths instead of waiting until the three eighths pole. And that's your chance to get away. So if it's going to be there, it'll be there today. Let's talk about the two McPeak horses, obviously, the five and the six, um, five days later in Dennington. I like one, you like the other one, but they kind of are. Are they clones of each other? Which one's going to show up? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. I like the looks of Dennington okay. out on the racetrack, a little bit more body to him. And um, I, I won't disagree with Andy about the Jockey Club, Kentucky Jockey Club uh, race. Uh, how good was it? But he had a horrendous trip. No fault of Brian Hernandez's that day. He was trapped down on the fence. And when everybody was moving forward, he was moving backwards. He swung out about yeah. five, six wide, came running, uh, wasn't beaten that far. And I like what I see out on the racetrack. And I think a long shot for both of us here, Gary and myself, you know, Angel Empire, Empire really powered home last time. I, I understand he needs to step it up a little bit. But at this odds right now, 18 to 1, that's a little too high, no Gary? Yeah, and how often do we see the other yeah. Cox or the other Lucas or the other anybody? Yeah. It happens all the time. So they, they b both came here with purpose, I believe. Yeah, so Kenny, uh, Gary and I are going to, Pick McPeak over Cox, I guess, Lafitte. <laughs> and Gary, a, a situation you've been in so many times during the course of your career. All of those Kentucky Derby preps. You won three Kentucky Derbies, multiple Preakness's Belmont Stakes. I know it's only January 1st, but what, what are you looking for at this stage with these newly turned three-year-olds? You're looking for your horse to be... Uh, leave their running put you in position it's so important in the kentucky derby this is when they start learning and you start putting them in positions that they're going to be in uh you're in a way test driving them for that day first saturday in may in the kentucky derby so you're putting them in difficult positions and in positions you're going to be forced into on that big day if they can't handle it today you might learn something about them or they learn an experience you step forward to the next race the southwest and just keep moving forward that's what you're hoping for to see a horse that's going to progress. These three-year-olds in the Smarty Jones and Andy, another aspect of this particular path to the Derby is for a lot of horses who perform at racetracks that don't have massive crowds, they can be affected by the energy of 150,000 people the first Saturday in May at Churchill Downs at Oak Lawn with the bigger crowds and specifically on an Arkansas Derby Day where they have, I don't know, 70, 80,000, 90, whatever it is it becomes a better, you know, like a final dress rehearsal, being exposed to all the elements that they could be faced with come the first Saturday in May. You know, it's something that I just know nothing about. I know they'll say that, and obviously it makes sense you saying it, you know, experience in front of big crowds. Whether or not, you know, how much it affects them, I just don't, I don't know. You know, that's something you'd have to really talk to people who ride them or you know, somebody who's more familiar with it. Um, I just, I, w I don't know.
But it's an interesting point, and I think it might be one of the sure, reasons if, people if, may if like to go there a little bit more than other tracks. If you're faced with that massive crowd for the very first time at Churchill, if you've raced in one of these major preps at Oakland, there is some familiarity to a, a bigger, a bigger crowd. Warming up for the Smarty Jones here, one to two victory formation. J.K., what'd you come up with here? Who takes down this Smarty Jones? Yeah, look, I, I think victory formation, I, even if I try to get clever, it would be the five who I think is taking more money than I feel like is worth the opportunity of trying to beat the eight. I, I just think victory formation is going to be tough for a number of reasons. Uh, this horse has the fastest speed figure, but also has the fastest early pace figures, which means that uses a lot of or has used in the past a lot of early energy, a lot of energy early in the race running really hard. And I think that now the fact that this horse is going to be able to stretch out a little bit won't have to run nearly as hard early to get that position. Like uh, Gary mentioned, that draw towards the outside to be able to kind of see what's inside of him. You get Flavian Pratt, who I, I think is an outstanding rider. And you get Brad Cox, who's been on the scene quite some time now and, and, and is taking all of our attention like a Todd Pletcher, a, a, a Bob Baffert, a Chad Brown that gets these good, talented three-year-olds and progresses with them through this uh, triple crown run. But the thing I like about victory formation the most, Andy touched on it for a second earlier in the show, this is a tap rate, right? If you, This is a horse that you feel like is going to want to go further, not sprint. So when you're a answering the question, does this horse want to stretch out? I think the answer is yes. The dam also produced a horse by the name of Bellamore, okay, that ran out in California. This horse hit the board in a state going 10 furlongs, hit the board in a state going 11 furlongs. So to me, the distance isn't going to be an issue. So I feel like if this horse is going to take a step forward off of that sprint effort, going to be extremely hard to beat, especially from a tactical standpoint, victory formation looks to be loose. And if we've learned anything about Brad Cox through his run of success, he does not take speed away from fast horses. Ask Nick's go. Brad Cox has made it very clear, excited about seeing victory formation run at a longer distance. First time around two turns. Any trainers represented in today's Smarty Jones dash attack last year, Penny McPeak, Caddo River two years ago. Speaking of speed and Brad Cox, Gold Street, Steve Asmussen, each of them, the winners of the last three Smarty Jones represented in today's Smarty Jones. It's the usual suspects as expected. I don't have a problem with victory formation. And as I've said, there's no argument he's the one to beat and he is the controlling speed. And as a son of Tappert, from a pedigree standpoint, he should like the distance, but he's two to five. And I have a problem with that. And I don't believe there's an argument that he's 70% to win this race. He's still stretching out. He still beat a horse that came back to lose as a heavy favorite last time out. His trainer, while he has decent numbers winning stretching out, they're not the kind of numbers you want with a two to five shot. No trainer has the kind of numbers you want with a two to five shot. And the other problem I have is that he is not a layover in speed figures. When I see a two to five shot, I know the entry lost today's eighth race at Aqueduct, but you had the fastest speed horse and the best closer. They lost, a horse improved to beat them, maybe they didn't run their numbers, a wet track, things happen. And by the way, things happen. But there was a real reason why two horses that both would have been heavily favored and were the right horses, at least on paper. He's the right horse on paper, but he's not two to five on paper. No, the, I think that as impressed as I was by the, the grit, the determination, the heart he displayed in his second career start, great. That, that's all really, really yeah. good. What bothers me is that he was in that position to begin with. Yeah. The, I, I thought he, he looked done. At the top of okay. the stretch. Okay. And right. And I mean, I don't love that he lost, that he beat a horse that came they back came, and lost yeah. mm -hmm. at a short price. I'm sorry. It may be apples and oranges. But as a player, I think we can all understand why a favorite is favored. The question is, why do you want to have some questions? And the shorter the price, the more important every question is, you know? You're betting six to one shots, five to one shots. See, there are plenty of reasons uh, sure. why the horse isn't going to win. Yeah. But when you can make a case why they can win, that's good. But the shorter they get, the more you get interested in making cases why you don't want to bet on them. And I have no problem. I think he should be even money. I don't think he should be one to two. Victory formation. The road to the Arkansas Derby begins here at Oaklawn Park. Smarty Jones, 20 Kentucky Derby points available, 10 to the winner, all eyes on victory formation, one to two at post time. The Smarty Jones, live from Oakland. Here's Vic Stoffer. The last two to load are Western Gent and victory formation.
They're at the post. They're off. Victory formation broke beautifully. Goes to the front from Western Gent, who is sent for speed early. CJ Storm is also there, and victory formation looks like he'll only be in the three path at the clubhouse turn. Nope, he's going to cross and clear, and Flavian Pratt asked him for speed, and he beats Western Gent to the punch at the clubhouse turn. Victory formation takes charge. Then comes communication memo. How did he do that in Dennington? Followed by Angel of Empire, and the distant trailer is 10 days later as the undefeated victory formation is the leader to the back stretch. He leads it by a length and a half from Western Gent who now tugs up and is going to try to challenge from the outside. These two are four lengths clear of Longshot CJ's Storm. Communication Memo and Angel of Empire are together. They're about four from the front. Angel of Empire is about to move into third under Joe Talamo and he's about two and a half from his front running stable mate. Dennington and how did he do that or next? The trailer is still ten days later. The finish line is the 16th pole and victory formation is still in charge victory formation gallops along a length and a half in front of western gent in second angel of empire continues to move he could get into second soon to the outside cj storm and communication memo victory formation he's at the top of the stretch and he's built up a three length lead the whip is out on western gent angel of empire is at the rail and victory formation comes to the final 16th in front by two lengths angel of empire is running a very good race trying to run down his stable mate but he's going to be second to the Sparty Jones stakes winner the undefeated Victory Formation Victory Formation beat Angel of Empire Brad Cox won two Dennington might have just nipped Western Gent for third all out to win his last race not today Victory Formation broke sharp made the lead takes command wire to wire in the Smarty Jones undefeated Brad Cox won two in the Smarty Jones. He did what he had to do to get it done. Final time of 138 and change. Not setting any race on fire, but we'll have to check out the, how the figures come back. Out to Paul at Oakland standing by live with winning trainer Brad Cox. Congratulations. I'm with winning trainer Brad Cox who runs 1-2 here in the Smarty Jones. Listen, the question was victory formation. Could he handle the distance, Brad? Yeah, he showed it today. I mean, he's bred to do it. Um, he's got the right mind. This is a, this colt's got a, a great mind. He doesn't overdo it in the mornings. And uh, the colt that runs second, I think uh, more ground, the better for him as well. So yeah, he grinded both, a, both good horses. Yeah, he grinded away a good little second here. I mean, he, did, were you expecting Flavian to get to the front end? Is that what you asked? No, nah, I just told him to break and put him where he's comfortable. He easily got to the front. So, that you know, that that I like seeing that, you know, especially two turns or further the better when he's able to break and get a great position and kind of shut off and relax up the backside. It was a good ride, and he's a nice horse. Obviously, both these horses need to cool out. Are you going to keep him here at Oakland? Um, I'm not certain where we'll, you know, run next, or uh, they'll probably ship south and start preparing for, you know, um, bigger races along the Derby Trail, but just very happy with both of them today, and hopefully uh, they bounce out of it in good, good order. We won't get in a hurry. You know, the goal is the first Saturday in May, and, uh, you know, we'll get there the best way we can. Congratulations. Go take your, tip, your picture, Brad. Brad Cox, he referenced that first Saturday in May. He's been mandaloon, right? By disqualification, a Kentucky Derby winning trainer. He'd like to experience it outright in the moment, of course. Central quality of Belmont Stakes winner, victory formation, earns 10 points towards the Kentucky Derby. A long way to go, and as Brad said, he passed the test and he got it done. I'll be interested to see the speed figures. Um, he's not on my list right now, but maybe he ran a big number. But I, I, I you know, none of, neither of the three or five ran a step in here. Maybe they both stink, but they were the main competition on paper, and they didn't show up at all. You could see this coming, rounding the far turn. Flavian Pratt was still on victory formation, checking the rearview mirror, and you're watching the body language on the other jockeys. They're encouraging, they're scrubbing. And right. the three-year-olds weren't responding. Yeah, no, I mean, they were never getting them. I mean, look at the horses behind them. It was Western Gent and Angel of Empire, and I don't think anybody is confusing them with triple crown contenders. He won, and you don't want to beat up on horses that won, and I'm not looking to do that. He passed the test. He got it done. It is very early, but he also has time to improve. Happy New Year, Frank Fl Fletcher. Frank Triquette yesterday, Victory Formation co-owner along with Spendthrift Farm, the Taprit Colt undefeated. Wire to wire in the Smarty Jones. Much more from Oaklawn as America's Day at the Races continues on Fox Sports 2. And obligatory goes by the ball. And Here comes Malathon. Here comes Clarier on the outside. 
that. They're coming to the finish, and it's got to be Clarier. Nest, much the best. She won by better than 10 lengths. Cody's wish on the outside. Cody's wish with the upset in the Fargo. Malathon grabs the lead in deep stretch, and Malathon has won the personal instant stakes. Curly, the classic sire. Who are you betting on? How about an app created specifically for horse racing? Naira Bets. We specialize in thundering hooves, fist pumping, and boosting your bankroll with robust weekly promotions. And offer betting tips from actual horse racing experts. Bet all day and night nationwide. Get the action and thrill of horse racing with Naira Bets. Introducing Gift Box, winner of the Grade 1 Santa Anita Handicap. He's a three-time graded stakes winning millionaire with four triple digit buyers and a four ragazin to his name. He proved himself early as a graded stakes place two year old and now his career as a stallion is just getting started. From the first crop of the leading sire twirling candy out of a multiple graded stakes producing mare. Gift Box, only at Lane's End. It's America's original sport, and no one covers it better than America's Best Racing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle, the best races, horses, and destination venues, cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more, America's Best Racing.net is a sport for you. Live it, love it, bet it. Dust settling at Oakland following that wire to wire performance. Victory formation in the Smarty Jones. You're watching America's Day at the Races. Brought to you in part by Naira Betts. Any track, including Oakland, anywhere, anytime with Naira Betts. Get started at NairaBets.com today. So here's what we're talking about. And for victory formation, you could see the other horses. And when the riders were asking them to really pick up their feet, not able to close the gap on victory formation, who maintains his lead throughout. And in his first time around two turns, Brad Cox had said how excited he was about the added distance. Makes sense. He's by a Belmont winner in Taprit. All out to win that second career race. This one uh, made it look all too easy. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe we can show that stretch again. I mean, I'm not saying he was in a full out drive, but, but he's riding him oh, down the stretch. It's not, you know, this isn't one of those he won, you know, wrapped up. He's riding him in there. And listen, you got to pass tests. And there are plenty of horses that look just sort of mediocre and in January or December and you you have a plan and you're getting him somewhere. So I don't think that Brad expects him to run a, a hundred buyer and, and explode. And sometimes some trainers think they do it too early. Still, this is not a strong field that he beat. The competition is going to get sterner for him. I'm sure Brad is well aware of that as well. He's a promising horse at this point. Not a bad time to have a promising horse. Went out and uh, did what he was his Expected to, yeah. and, and we'll see now yeah. as you know, the competition gets tougher. And we'll see uh, what's next if it is the Southwest at the end of the month. And Brad Cox will try to figure out the best plan in terms of getting to the Kentucky Derby if, in fact, he is a Kentucky Derby caliber horse. But ten points—it's a good start. Uh, there's a lot, of, and if he's not, there's a lot of good races for him. If he's a horse that's better going a little shorter, we've got a couple of good Grade Ones here in New York, and you've got a lot of races, and Brad's got a lot of operations, and you find out how good they are and where they belong. And Brad's probably thinking two races maybe to lead up to the Derby if he can get there, and he'll figure out the right ones for him. Brad's pretty good. Won the uh, Arkansas Derby uh, last year with Cyberknife, Brad Cox. That's two of the last three. Smarty Jones's uh, Caddo River, wire to wire, a couple of years back. And here, wire to wire, victory formation does not disappoint at Oaklawn Park. One left from Oaklawn. And when we come back, a chance to reflect the highlights in New York. 2022, Mo Donegal, Rapoli 1-2 in the Belmont Stakes. Epicenter finally at Travers for Steve Asmussen as we look back at some of the highlights of racing last year in New York. Whether it's Division I or Grade 1, top athletes have certain traits in common. Speed, strength, class, versatility, and most of all, willpower. Claiborne Farm Stallion, War of Will, was a grade one winner on both dirt and turf. 
Now, his first foals are taking the field. Flight line is in full flight. He had a slow start, but a terrific finish in the... Flight line is in full flight. He had a slow start, but a terrific finish in the grade one mid mile. Jackie's Warrior wins an unprecedented grade one stakes at the spa for the third straight season. And in Italian, wins the Diana in front running fashion. The final time of the race was one minute, 45 seconds. This is a new course record. It is Valleluia at 24 to one. Trained by Robbie Davis, the jockey, Jackie Davis. Here is Nest, and she is pouring it on here in the stretch. Nest wins the Alabama by five lengths. And life is good, breaks in stride from the outside. Life is good, still in front, life is good. Malathot grabs the lead in deep stretch, and Malathot has won the personal incident. Here is Casa Creed, who makes the last move, the winning move in the grade one for Star Dave. Jackie's Warrior tested here today. Cody's Wish on the outside. Cody's Wish with the upset in the Fargo. A Saratoga moment for the ages. Win number 1,000 at the spa for Hall of Fame jockey, Johnny Velasquez. And he is at the top of the three-year-old class. Epicenter won the Jim Dandy, and he backs it up in the run, Happy Travers. Warlike goddess, he's gonna beat the boys today in this grade one Joe Hirsch Turf Classic. And elite power will continue his winning ways here, taking the grade two Vosburg. A record setting stakes victory for jockey Rod Ortiz Jr. Stakes win number 77. Mo Donegal bearing down on the outside. It's Mo Donegal and early voting, and it is Mo Donegal. Won the Remsen here as a two-year-old, and he comes back to win the Wood Memorial. And it is Mo Donegal, the Wood winner, who has taken over, and it will be Mo Donegal to win the test of the champion. Nest was second, so it's Todd Pletcher, 1-2 in the 2022 Belmont Stakes. Reserved for Todd Fletcher. That is that is so good. Uh, what a year. 2022. Some of the highlights of racing here in New York. Just an incredible, incredible year. Yeah, racing. and I mean, Todd Fletcher winning the Belmont. I mean, he's, he's, he's not. I don't think he's going to do it what he Stevens did and win five straight. <laughs> and one of the great achievements in the history of racing. But Todd's 
record in the Belmont is is nothing short of remarkable. Of all those highlights, all those moments we just revisited, what was what was the one that, that stands out for you? Well, I think, you know, I, I went through it. Not, you know, it's so many of those moments, and they were terrific performances, and we so enjoy the racing here in New York. I thought Flightline's Met Mile stood out. Obviously, Flightline, he was the story of 2022, and justifiably. But he came to New York, and most of us knew he was something special. Whether or not we could have predicted he would do what he did in the Pacific Classic and then his amazing Breeders' Cup performance, another story, but we had seen him. But he hadn't run against actual competition, and he was running against Speaker's Corner, who had run a 110 buyer and impressively winning our Carter, and had obviously shown that he was a superior animal. His poor heart got broken by flight line, and then Life is Good sort of nailed the final nail into, his, into, into him. But it wasn't just that he won as impressively as he did. It was the way the race was run. He didn't break. Mm -hmm. He tried to make that move inside Speaker's Corner. Junior Alvarado did a great job of race riding and just shutting him off and making him come around. It just didn't matter. He just treated Speaker's Corner like he was a gnat, like he was a 20 claimer who had no business being on the racetrack with him. We're talking about a legitimate grade one winner in Speaker's Corner who was in tremendous form. And Flightline just dismissed him like he didn't belong on the racetrack. And I think that performance is one went, even if he had any detractors left, not that there were that many, but that was the one. Because, yes, he had a big win in the Malibu. This was when he faced real competition. The Malibu is an important race and has a tremendous history of winners. But this was the one where he faced competition. He faced adversity. And he showed he could deal with adversity quite easily and still run fast races. And I think that Met Mile was the one that made it a little less surprising when he went out and did what he did in his next two starts. Which, again, just glad that the, the fans in New York got a chance to see yeah. him in person, just like the fans in Kentucky had a chance to see Flightline in person. JK, for you, what stands out? Your favorite moment, 2022, in New York racing. Yeah, I mean, there's so many that are surrounded around the horses, right? And, and so many, uh, and, and they are the stars of the show. But I got to be honest with you, I, I was extremely excited to see Johnny Velasquez get his hundredth, excuse me, his thousandth win at Saratoga. We, we, we're at Saratoga. We spend so much time in New York seeing all these unbelievable riders. We talk about how tough the, the room is in New York. It's always been tough, and it's been tough for majority of Johnny's career. And the fact that he found a way to get a thousand wins at Saratoga it says a lot about how talented he is uh, how committed to his career he's been um, his ability to stay healthy enough to get that many wins and, and to, to keep riding through to this age and I think it's just it's, it's fun because it's a very fun mark that we can now watch some of the younger guys try to chase down right watching an IRAD eventually you'd like to think if he can stay healthy he'll get to that thousandth win at Saratoga and just the mentorship that Johnny has to these young riders especially the riders from Puerto Rico right with IRAD and Jose who have that picture I love to see with them in the jocks room with Johnny I just think it's a great story and very happy for Johnny as a man and, and, and just but also uh, as a rider so that was a lot of fun for me a mentor they all look up to Johnny Velasquez you're hard pressed to find a record at Saratoga for a rider that doesn't belong to Johnny Velasquez his thousandth career victory incredible this summer at Saratoga uh, Gary and Paul are with us from Oaklawn Park guys uh, looking back at the last 12 months of racing specifically here in New York for you guys what what stood out as a, a favorite moment in racing Go ahead and go first. I'll go first. Okay. Uh, for me, it was uh, epicenter, guys, uh, in the Travers, in the Run Happy Travers. I pulled it off in the Jim Dandy, came back. And I love when a plan comes together. I'm a huge fan of this sport, not just part of it, but I, I love seeing a good horse race. I love poetry in motion. And that day with epicenter and the Run, high, run Happy Travers, it was poetry in motion. Watching Joel Rosario just let him lengthen his stride, came in uh, with a ton of confidence into the lane. And when he opened up, it was a show for me, and I really enjoyed that moment. You? Yeah, listen, it, Epicenter was up there. I remember when we were putting these in, I, I had Epicenter up there. But you know what? I'm going to go with Robbie Davis and Jackie Davis. Val, and I don't know if I'm saying this right. Val Hulia or Val 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 Valaluya? Yes. I mean, listen, like that. when you win for your dad, now I, I, I asked Gary this, you know, that, that hug in that circle when Jackie Davis crossed the line for Robbie Davis. So then I asked Gary right before we're doing this, hey, Gary, you ever run races for your family? He goes, yeah, I won my first race for my mom and dad. So how does that feel, actually? Uh, it's an unbelievable feeling. Uh, my first thoroughbred uh, race was for my mom and dad on a filly named Little Star, a moment that I'll never forget. And it was a kickoff of uh, uh, tremendous 
uh, career and ride for me and for it to happen and start with my mom and dad my brother in the jocks room riding against him that day yeah. it was pretty special and I, and I know you know Robbie because you rode yes. road Robbie it had to be pretty cool to you to watch for you to watch Jackie and Robbie get, yeah. embrace each other and, and a fellow Idaho native yeah uh, from Pocatello Idaho I'm from Boise Idaho so we've uh, grown a great friendship over the years and uh, I got a tickle out of that yeah. that day. So many great headlines, obviously, in Naira this year, and hopefully we picked out a, a couple good ones for you. That really was one of them, and one that sticks from Saratoga with father and daughter celebrating that win at Valleluia. We were getting ready to start the, the uh, Four Star Dave show, and right at the top, we're like, here, we got this great grade one race, and Chad Brown's trying to win his first Four Star Dave, but we may have already seen the best thing we're going to see in racing today. After that, Valleluia win. I mean, it's fun, and you think about the success the family has had. Obviously, Robbie, who was a tremendous rider for so many years, mostly in New York. But you're seeing how well Dylan's doing. Jackie's having a terrific career, doing what she does. Katie's done well. She's come back to riding again after having uh, her first kid and came back and won a couple races. And it's just a really good story with the whole family together and seeing that happen. It, it was a lot of fun. Tremendous year of thoroughbred racing, and we get to do it all over again. And speaking of those three-year-olds, uh, the Jerome next Saturday right here at Aqueduct and the first step towards the Wood Memorial and eventually the Kentucky Derby, the path through New York. The path through Hot Springs is underway as we watch the Smarty Jones victory formation, wire to wire, one left from Oakland in the New Year's Day program. That's next on America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. Every hair, every muscle, every contour, every pulse. In the juvenile. Essential quality has won. In the Belmont. Essential quality has won the Belmont Stakes. Well named. Proluma is the all-natural, non-medicated, targeted therapy top horsemen choose to reduce bleeding caused by strenuous exercise. We use it for preventative, and also we start horses on it if after a race or after a workout they bleed. The success has been tremendous. Proluma's active ingredient, Noto Ginseng, has proven hemostatic properties. Consult your veterinarian prior to administering. Go natural. Visit Prolumo.com to order today. It's a domineering display by the ultra-talented McKinsey. McKinsey in a dominant performance. 300 Honda, 300,000. 275 medium, 275,000. 75 but to get 75, 275,000. 250 on Ralph now, 250,000. You're able to get two, but two, but two hundred thousand dollars. Delphi Racing Club, offering a truly personal racing experience. Looking to own thoroughbred racehorses and win at the highest level circuits? We're not just a syndicate, and our members aren't just investors. We are partners. Experience the Adelphi difference. Join the club today. Contact us to get a taste of the Adelphi Racing Experience, and let's win races together. You're watching America's Day at the Races from Oaklawn Park. As always, brought to you in part by America's Best Racing for the love of the race. Visit americasbestracing.net today. Close the show in Hot Springs with these Arkansas breads. Six furlong sprint. $40,000 claimers. And you're looking at the fa uh, Navy SEAL. The favorite, though, Gar Hole, number five at six to five. Back out to Oaklawn. Gary and Paul standing by. What do you think, guys? Who takes down the nightcap? Uh, well, hopefully we could take down the nightcap. I, I just found out some information that's actually crazy. It just shows you how this works in the trainer's world. And I can imagine what you had to do flying on planes. But Brad Cox actually had to watch Cyberknife work earlier in the morning and then hop on the plane to get her because Cyberknife was running in, in the Pegasus. And then he runs 1-2 in the Smarty Jones. Okay, let's get to the last race, Gary. Um, Mrs. Beans from the inside. Now, she won in an off... Uh, Mrs. Uh, Beans, by the way, is actually a gelding. Just... Just yes, and she's not married to Mr. Bean, exactly. who's one of my favorite actors, by exactly. the way, and a great comedy actor. But she won off the pace last time, and she's a tiny bit washy, but you said you, you that's her. That's the way she acts yeah, most he, of the time. Yeah, he, he gets he. hot. Um, 
you know, and with these cold temperatures we've had now yeah. 71 degrees uh, today, it's not odd for him to get a little bit hot, so I'm not worried about that and coming off a nice win last time out. And then you got Garhole. Okay, so the five Garhole has been taking a lot of money. If you look at this horse, you know, he's run um, seven times. He's been the favorite five out of those seven times. He's disappointed. He's four out of seven. But Johnny Ortiz having a little tough of a meet. Yeah, he is. He started off uh, pretty cold here, yet to get a winner. And uh, horses are just off. He looked great out on the racetrack. Garhole, I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm a little leery about sinking everything into yeah. it. I'm going to throw a horse out there uh, that's going to be a price. He is a price. I'm more than blessed. The three horse that was a winner yeah. here going long last year, Andrew, Andrew Cascio told me that the horse is very, very sharp right now. He wants to get a race into him, but don't be surprised if he doesn't pick up some pieces uh, the last eighth of a mile and come running and, uh, for a placing in here. But look for him when he stretches out the next time. Yeah, and my horse would be uh, Mrs. Beans and Garho. If they go at it, I, I think the nine banded point with Kelsey Har would be flying late. If Garho or the one get away from each other and one of them breaks bad, they could be tough to beat in here. But it's been a great day here, Gary. Glad to have you um, as well. Um, and what do you think of victory formation going forward? You thought that was impressive? Yeah, it was very impressive. I, I love it when a, a route horse shows that kind of speed. He relaxed well down the backside, and he was always in control. I thought it was a powerful performance, and it was a powerful performance for the second-place horse as well. That's all I need to hear from a Hall of Fame jockey. Great stuff all afternoon. Gentlemen, Happy New Year to both of you. And good stuff from Oakland Park and the Smarty Jones program winding down with one left the ninth where we have reached post time and Andy there were a couple of scratches that really did change the complexion of the race. Well I mean you know like Jonathan I used the pace projector at time form and you and I were talking about it a bit I think off camera yeah. and how how much how accurate it is at Oakland. It really seems to fall in a line a lot. Well they had a fast pace with the 111 and 12 involved in the pace and then I looked at the scratches earlier and I went oh the 11 and when I do the scratches I always go to the pace projector and I want to like you know are they horses that affect the pace a lot of times they're horses that aren't really involved I went oh that's pretty good for Mrs. Beans I prefer Mrs. Beans at two to one the second choice JK nightcap from Oakland who do you like. Yeah, look, I mean, I thought it was one of these two, and, and to be fair, I, I was trying to separate the two, and I, I had a really hard time. Miss Beans to the inside, um, you know, if you look at her time form, U.S. pace figures and speed figures, you know, she, she looks like she should win based off of her last couple of races. She's drawn on the inside. She's supposed to kind of be sent away from there. She's supposed to be loose, and and she's she looks to be faster. The, the issue that I have is that Garhol, who was – was really good for about a three or four race, race stretch last year. It came in last time off a 220 day break, chasing a slow pace and just didn't necessarily fire at Indiana. And and, and so I think now getting back to Oakland Park, getting back in uh, you know kind of the home track, you, you got to think this horse is going to take a step forward off of the last performance. You got to think that this horse was probably a little bit short. Uh, the the situation didn't necessarily you know pan out. For Garhol, and if Garhol can find that March 5th race from last year, that February 13th race, the January 15th race, now Garhol is right there where with Miss Beans is. So, really, the decision comes down to: Do you think Garhol is going to take another step forward, or do you think he lost a step? I'm going to go with take a step forward. I like the draw being outside of Mrs. Beans. Mrs. Beans is going to be tough, but I think Garhol uh, can run him down. Ooh, the Miss Beans thing threw me off. Real quick, J.K., didn't have a chance to ask you, how impressed were you by victory formation in the Smarty Jones? You know, <laughs> I, don't, I say it a little nicer than Andy does, but, I, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to get ready for these Triple Crown races. The Kentucky Derby is what it is, and we all love it for all the reasons that we love it. But I try not to get overly excited about any horses on prep races because the distances start to get further. They start to get face uh, – tougher company and 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 i want to see the speed figure because that's what i base a lot of my opinions on i i'm not an eye test guy i don't care if a horse wins by 12 if they did it slow it just means the horses behind them were slow so we'll see what the speed figure comes back but like i said i try not to get overly excited about any horse i fell in love in love with verrazano back in in 2013 i think it was and uh, we all know how that panned out in the Kentucky Derby. I, I think you want to wait till you get a little further along uh, on the trail and make sure you're looking at the speed figures to understand how fast these horses are going and which ones are going to appreciate the added distance. So that's my long way of saying uh, I'm not really sure, Lafitte. 
Now, the, the eye I, test is foolproof. Tried and true. Never misses. The dumbest thing anyone could possibly say in racing <laughs> is the eye test. Um, I don't think Jonathan said anything different, than, by the way, than I said. And I don't think I wasn't nice about it. I think I'm being realistic. And the last thing we should do is lie to the people listening here. And to suggest he won. He got it done. But as Jonathan said, and I agree, I think we were exactly the same place. We were one of the speed figures. It's going to get tougher. And you know what? I think Brad Cox would say the exact same thing. Sure. He's happy he won. I don't think Brad thought that was the Kentucky Derby. It's a stepping stone. They're using it. We'll see going forward. I did not think that Garhol ran well last time. I know he was off a long layoff. I thought it was a poor performance. Yeah, they need a race into him. They want to get to Oakland. He'll probably run well. But I think Mr. Bean should be favored in this race. I think he's the likeliest winner here. I thought Garhol's last race was decidedly flat. Six to five just sounds derogatory, like something you'd... That's a gar hole. Greg, Holt, Greg, Greg Wolf is going to be very annoyed when I text him later and tell him that he missed Gar Hole's race because Greg loves Gar Hole. What's the story? He just loves him. He's a cool because we saw him break his maiden and we gotcha. saw him progress last year and it was fun watching the races and seeing him get better. And Greg just really got a kick out of Gar Hole. So he's going to be. I, I was going to text him the other night and I was going to say you're going to be very sad to know that you're missing Gar Hole. Uh, if you returning. text him like right now, maybe he'll catch it because we have a slight. Well, we'll see because uh, UVC number seven just. Broke through the front of the barrier. Greg is sleeping right now. I no. let all you right. know, so I don't Take think he's going to get it at all. Waiting to see if there's an announcement of any sort. UVC doesn't figure to impact anything one way or the other. But uh, he's right back into the gate, so no. We're all set. Garhol steps forward for John Ed Anthony, the favorite, the ninth and final. Vic Stoffer one final time on New Year's Day from Oakland Park. They're at the post. Blame JD has backed out. Now he's in. They're set. They're off. Mrs. Beans and Garhol, the two favorites break well. UVC away a sharp third, and these three are quickest. Then comes Navy Seal, followed by 110 Stadium, Bandit Point, and Blame JD. Big success has two beat. They are Twisted Dixie, and the trailer is more than blessed. Garhol, quickest into the far turn, and he leads it by a length over Mrs. Beans, who's in second, just ahead from UVC in third. Navy Seal is fourth and two from the front. Blame JD will be four wide. Then comes 110 Stadium, big success. Bandit Point and Twisted Dixie. They're only about five from the front. Far back to more than blessed, and Gar Hole is doing it well. Gar Hole to the quarter pole with a solid two length lead over Navy Seal. Mrs. Beans at the rail and UVC. Gar Hole the one to catch, and he's still in hand for Ricardo Santana Jr. Gar Hole off the top of the turn. He's got a two length lead over Navy Seal. Seal. Mrs. Beans will have to do more from the inside, and Garhole is strong. Garhole now with a three length lead. A late charge from Bandit Point and 110 Stadium, but Garhole is just too good. He's going to win it in hand. Garhole in front. Garhole won by two and a quarter. Mrs. Beans was second. Navy Seal third. 110 Stadium finished fourth. Convincing win. Garhole. John Ed Anthony's five-year-old lightly raced, eight starts, five wins, each of them at Oaklawn Park. Greg's going to be more upset if he wasn't here to see this performance. And once the one, Mrs. Beans didn't break that sharply, and the rider showed no interest in being aggressive to go in there, and Garhol was able to control, this race was completely and totally over, but he was the best horse. Easiest of winners, the favorite, Garhol, and wasn't favored. Yeah, what? But, so, yeah, my seven mistake. Slightly, seven, not as fa much, seven, not as big a favor as yeah. he was going to the gate, to be fair. Seven to five. Owner John Ed Anthony, he owned the Smarty Jones winner two years ago in Caddo River. He owned some pretty good horses over the years. I think he's Temperance the only Hill. owner in Oakland history to have a winner of each of the three-year-old derby preps. Smarty Jones, Southwest, really? Rebel, Arkansas Derby. Well, he certainly had a very good horse in Temperance Hill. Temperance Hill. And Cox's Ridge. Prairie Bayou. Cox's Ridge. He was when I, early, not right when I first, but right a few years into it, he was a tremendous racehorse.
Demons Be Gone. Yeah, Pine I love Bluff. Demons Be Gone. Cool horse. Some real good horses. And Garhol. Who rolls in this ninth at Oaklawn Park. The pat on the shoulder from Ricardo Santana, teaming up with John Ortiz. Garhol will wrap it all up. The results following this ninth from Oaklawn Park, winding things down on America's Day at the Races. Consistently versatile with 25 grade one winners on every surface from six furlongs to one and a quarter miles all over the world. Switzerland in the Dubai Golden Shaheen. Switzerland wins. Charles fight running on. Mason in front. Charles fight on the outside. At the wire. Photo for the win. Olympiad gets the gold in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. All purpose. All places. All power. Spice Town. Garhol knows that spot well. The winner's circle at Oaklawn Park. Fifth win in his career, all in Hot Springs. Ah, he's a cool horse. It's nice to see him get back in there. And he broke sharply, showed he was sharp today. And once he got that jump on Mrs. Beans, whatever chance she, he had, it, I always want to say she, uh, was, was evaporated. It is confusing. Yes. You do it on purpose. Garhol, 7-5 to five over Mrs. Beans and Navy Seal. Garhol, just too much in the ninth race, Oaklawn Park. We're not done, though. Paula Duke is still with us. Game of Silks, Polly. We have two more envelopes to reveal, and you, my friend, are up next. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I think this is my last one, right, Lafitte? I've last had four one. so far. This is my last one. Okay, yeah, last one. Uh, do we get a drum roll? I, you, you get that. We, I mean, does you get that. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mitch needs to do, do way more stuff in the truck. Okay, hold on a second. What? I love it. And here's the best part about it. You have a Take Charge Indy Colt. And look at the name of the mares. We're on January 1st. The name of the mare is Goals. Everybody has their goals going to 2023. My goal is for this New York bread to win at Saratoga first time out. Boom. The enthusiasm. He's feeling good about his... Latest addition to his stable. Uh, I got a Take Charge Indy, too, I believe. I think my first one was a Take Charge Indy. He was good. So, Paulie and I have dueling Take Charge Indies. A couple of Take Charge Indies. Oh, this is you my last reveal. Of, you have a couple of uh, audibles. I have two audibles. Right? That's correct. I do. So, another Take Charge Indy for Paulie. And we have one more envelope to uh, unveil. And my final one, I kind of like this. My final one's a cowbred. Did you cheat? I'm not supposed to look just yet. I just opened it. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to wait for this. Yeah, I cheated. You're supposed to wait. I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed of myself. I cheated. I know mine's a cow bread. Now you can open it. Mine is a cat burglar, and I'm going to have to say I don't remember cat burglar. I do I, I was in the dam before. The dam of cat burglar be my prospect. It's related to somebody. Uh, the third dam, actually the third dam, third family is distorted humor, actually. The Dancing Beauty, the third dam, was a dam of distorted beauty. Um, 
want to say Danzig Beauty may have been a Bruce Lunsford horse, but regardless, Catburger or Cowbred. $12,000 sales at the Cowbred, so I'll be looking for this horse out in California. Hopefully we'll yeah, see Yeah, I'm not familiar with Cat Burglar myself. No, no, I'm not either, but now I am. See, so I'm learning something follow. new. And hopefully we'll see this horse run at Del Mar while we're up in Saratoga. So I'll keep an eye. I like that we have them, not just New York, but look at the horse Absolutely. in California. Absolutely. Yeah. Silks.io for more information. Check out that website. Lots the 3D of fun. interactive website. Uh, the data, the NFT likeness of racehorses. You turn your horses into a digital asset. The metaverse where it meets horse racing ownership. Silks.io. I O. Fun day at Thoroughbred Racing on this uh, New Year's Day. Had a chance to see the Smarty Jones moments ago in a wire to wire performance. It's the favorite play of every offensive coordinator and head coach in the playbook. Victory formation, take a knee. He takes off. And as Andy, you mentioned, yeah, Flavian Pratt, he wrote him. He wrote yeah. him home. But I don't. I almost sometimes wonder if those, those, those standing up is it's not showboating per se. You want these horses to get something out of these races, you know? You want these horses to use these races to move forward. And uh, like, like Jonathan said, Knight said before, we'll, we'll wait and see what the fig is. Um, he certainly, you know, one of the things that bothered me about the race were that the second and third choices were complete and total no-shows. felt shows. like nobody else ran. Right, yeah. so that, I, like if they both ran second and third, it might have made me feel a little bit stronger about it. I'm not condemning the performance. I'm just taking a wait and see approach. And you should always be taking a wait and see approach on January 1st. Very, very early. Yeah. Very, very early. So onward and upward for victory formation, winning the Smarty Jones, the next stop en route to the Arkansas Derby. End of January, the very lucrative uh, $750,000 Southwest Stakes. Uh, here at Aqueduct, I believe on Friday, you had the Graves End. Andy, and an exciting, thrilling finish. No matter how many times I watch it, it drafted, like how? How did he get up in time? You and I thought it was at mm -hmm. best a dead heat, at but best, perhaps at the 11 for drafted, the yeah. horse uh, between horses held on for the victory, but drafted for our friend uh, Dave Duggan. Um, came through and Dave has taken over the training of I think, a dozen or so horses or maybe more for our Rick Schausberg, another mm -hmm. friend of ours who retired and we wish Rick a happy retirement. Today his official retirement starts. I thought Morello ran well in here. You know, he didn't break as he's usual, but he didn't break quite as badly, and he at least was competitive. But Draft is a very, very cool horse, and he put his run in. It wasn't a particularly fast pace. The other two six furlong races were fast paced races, and they were one wire to wire, both good horses, but wire to wire nonetheless. Whereas he had to come from last in a relatively moderate pace. One of the things I like about him is he's a horse who has been able to overcome sort of moderate paces and still put his runs in. He's a very, very neat horse, and he's turning nine. And we're looking forward to more from Drafted, and we know his trainer Dave Duggan will bring him back. What a finish! Like what? A, what a Bob! Yeah, what a Bob! Amazing Bob! Exciting, exciting race. Uh, that was the Graves End earlier today. Race number three, the Lady Stakes. Falconet up front, going to prove tough to catch in the end. The Ladies is one of the oldest races still run in this country. It was a grade one back in the 80s, another race that fell by the wayside as a result very much of the Breeders' Cup. I think we used to run it at the end of November, maybe even a little later. I remember a 14-horse field or something at Akron as a wow. grade one. Um, Howie Tesher, our good friend Howie Tesher, won this back, I think, 1990, 80 or 90, one of those years. So he's tweeting to me, and the Ladies won by uh, Falconet for Todd Fletcher. I. Whether or not you could have won the second place finisher, the second choice, not the best of trips in here. She didn't, none of them got the lead, and Falcon has better the lead, but then she kind of got shuffled a little on the turn. It wasn't Kendrick's fault. She really got caught between a rock and a hard place while Falconet was assuming control. And she got a chance to make that run, and she didn't gain a lot of ground right at the end, but she'd like another shot at Falconet. Maybe she'll get it. Interesting how much these races that they stick around, but how much they they change. Next Saturday we'll have the Jerome. It's a three-year-old prep en route to the Wood Memorial. But you look through the history books and the horses that won the Jerome over the years. Some of the best sprinters we've ever seen. You know, Housebuster won that that comes House to Buster mind. Housebuster won a fleet. His first mm -hmm. performance outside of Canada. I can still remember him. See him bouncing around the paddock. And a fleet was one of my favorite horses that nobody knows anything about. Look up his peepees sometime. And you know that Bernardini. I believe won it when we moved wow. it to Aqueduct as a prep for the for the uh, Preakness. That's right. In all three the three year olds in the Jerome next Saturday right here Aqueduct. Thanks so much for joining us on America's Day at the Races. Happy New Year, everyone. Where we watched 
Victory formation at Oakland in the Smarty Jones for trainer Brad Cox, two of the last three in very similar fashion. Cotto River, wire to wire. A couple of years back, victory formation, wire to wire. All smiles, Flavian Pratt. Frank Fletcher with something to celebrate New Year's Day. Spent through farm. Victory formation onward and upward in the Smarty Jones. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you next week. And that pick five carryover next Thursday at Aqueduct. We'll see you then. War Dancer. The momentum continues with recent stakes winners on turf and dirt. Dancing Buck going wire to wire in the grade three Belmont turf. Dancing Buck has opened up on the field. It is Dancing Buck by a half dozen lengths. And two-year-old Philly War Saichi with a wire to wire win in the Ladyfinger Stakes. War Saichi asserted her authority immediately out of the starting gate and she has not relinquished the lead. War Dancer, the number one third crop turf sire in North America. Proud to stand in New York. RaceLens is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. RaceLens, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. The Run Happies are hot, hot, hot with his two-year-olds burning up the track. Recent top burns include this growing list of winners at Churchill Downs. Plus the speedy two-year-old coat, Happy is a Choice, a five-length maiden winner at Keeneland. Happy is a Choice, Francisco Arietta to win it. Price for value and turning up the heat. Call today and book your merit of Eclipse champion Run Happy standing at Claiborne Farm. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on, every screen, on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.tv today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month.